Boy game is a great way to learn about games programming. As you can see right here, we are going to build this cool RPG game using boy game. We have used so many techniques in order to make this small game happen. We have created characters, we have created enemies, we have created obstacles. We also have some attack system. We can kill enemies and as you can see, we have a camera that is following our player in the tile map. We also have this particle system, as you can see, that is following the player wherever it goes. I mean, there is a lot of cool stuff that we can do just using boy game. And the techniques we will use here are going to be very, very fundamental in building larger RPG games. The techniques that we will use here, actually, are not just those regular boy game techniques where we just write a function, throw it away, and then try to call a bunch of functions inside each other. No, this one is very, very structured. We will be following the object-oriented programming style and programming this so that all the components are reusable. We will be using some design pattern in order to make our life easier, because in games, the more complex the game is, the harder it will be to just maintain it. We have divided our game into four files. One of them is for the sprites, for the configuration. We have one for the weapons. We have one for the main loop. And this structuring will not only teach you by game. It will also teach you a lot about Python itself. Because as I said, structuring is the basis of any large software. And as you can see here, we can pick up weapons from the floor and we can start shooting enemies with that weapon. I mean, we have tons to cover in this long course. So I really hope you enjoy this series. Don't forget to hit subscribe and like on this video if you like what we are doing. And let us get started. What I want to introduce to you right now is what we call sprite cheats. Now, all of those backgrounds and sceneries that you see in your game, in your 2D games, are going to be extracted from those sprite sheets. Now, sprite sheets are nothing but those sceneries, like here, this is a floor, this is some grass that you can have as a floor as well, let's say, if you are building an RPG game, like the one I have shown you. So, you can use some water around, like those tiles right here. You can use some stairs, you can use some waterfalls. I mean... You are going to be building a map using those sprite sheets. All we need to do is specify the coordinate of these, and then we are going to add them to the map. Now, the process of doing that, we are going to talk about it later, when we talk about tile maps. But I just wanted to give you an example on sprite sheets. Now, those sprite sheets are for sceneries and backgrounds, but we have more. We have this cool website that is called Open Game Art org where you can get all of those assets you can search for an asset and you can just use it now if we go maybe to bros to the art as you can see we have tons of sprite sheets for sceneries like this one for example is for assets as you can see we can get some masks we can get those potions maybe those are the power-ups that the player can pick when the player is navigating the map we have more tiles. As you can see, there is tons of sprite sheets that we can use. We even have those ready to use maps. Like for example, this one is giving you an overview of what you can do with this set right here if you download it. There is seas, there is some uh, stone ground, there is grass, there are trees. There is tons to use as you can see from here. Let's go to prose again, 2D art. Let's see if we can find some characters. Now, if we search for sprites, we can see characters as well. Like, take a look here. We have a character in all its angles. As you can see here, this is when the character is moving down. And as you can see, the legs are moving in those four pictures so that you get the feeling that the character is actually moving. We have the same thing for a different view, like for going left, for going up, and for going right. And we use those sprite sheets in order to animate the character in our game like for example if you take a look here i'm using this sprite sheet for my evil characters and it is the same thing they can go down left right and up and as my hero the one that is leading the game it's a cat 
and as you can see this cat also has all of those uh, motion directions so those are the basic building blocks whenever you, it comes to graphics now before we continue we are going to introduce a few more concepts let's talk about how can we create a map how about we talk about tile maps well Tile maps can be created in multiple ways, and we are going to be introducing the simplest way where you can create a tile map. Again, if you forgot what is a tile map, tile map is this one. Is the map itself, all of those stones, all the ground here, this is a tile map. It contains also where the enemies are located, where the player is initially located. This is what a tile map is. If you take a look here, we have a list. And this list contains rows and columns. Now, as you can see, if you take a closer look, you will recognize that this is the same map that we have seen before. Now, we are going to be replacing all of those letters with tiles. Now, those are the same tiles that we have seen before. Like, for example, if we open this here, we are going to replace all the B letters, maybe with some rocks, right? with some stones like maybe this one or this one and we are going to be replacing all the dots with some ground maybe like this ground here or this ground we can choose whatever we want so we are building a map by telling it that replace this character or this letter with whatever we have in our tile sheet now we also have here w's those will be replaced by the power ups e's are for the enemies we will be replacing with the enemy sprites and the P is the player that we will be replacing with a player. So this is basically how we can create tile maps. Now there is more complicated way to create them, but this one is great to get you started with creating your own maps. Okay, right now I'm just introducing all the key concepts here. Now the next thing we are going to introduce here is the main architecture that is going to be used to build this game. Okay, so right now we are going to talk about our Pi game architecture. Now, why do we need an architecture? Building a game can get complex really, really quickly. Like, I've shown you the game that we are going to build, and trust me, there is a lot of small pieces that are moving there to get you to that form. So, this is why we need a way to organize our code in a way that we can expand the game, we can add new features easily, and our friend to do that is object-oriented programming. So the game is going to start with a class here that we are going to call game. For simplification, assume that this game contains your tile map. It has all the locations for all the obstacles, all the walkable coordinates that the player can walk on. There is a lot of stuff actually are going on in game, which we will cover in a minute. But let me just visualize this to you. Next, we have our player class. So here we have our player. Okay, we will be creating classes for everything. Now, let's say that we have an enemy. We will create a new class here. And we are going to call it an enemy. And all the enemy features are going to be stacked in there. Now, let's say that we have a block. Okay, so this block right here will also have its own class. Let's say that we have a ground, a walkable ground. This one also will have its own class. Now, what will this class contain? What information? Well, let's say for player, we can have all the attacks that the player can do. We can have the health bar. We can have the X and Y coordinates for this player. Any feature that the player is going to have is going to be included in this class. Same thing for enemy. We have the enemy attacks. We have the health bar of every single enemy, we have the X and Y, and we have tons of stuff that we can add to the enemy. Now, a block, what could a block have? Well, we have its coordinate, and we have the collision. What do I mean by collision? We will be talking about collision later, but collision is basically when you have a box, let's say a block like that, and you have a character. Now, when the character walks into that block, you don't want the block and the character to overlap and you see the character just on top of the block. That would be a problem, right? What you want to do is you have a block here and you have your player and the maximum distance that the player can approach the block is maybe like something like this. If the player tries to move forward further, we should not be able to do that right this is what we call collision so the block will have xy it will have collisions it will have the tile shape that we have we can add whatever we want now the ground as well 
maybe it have the X and Y and only the tile. We won't have any collision on the ground because it's a walkable ground, meaning we can walk there without any issues. Now, see those four elements? Each of those is going to be a class. What's gonna happen is, after we create all of those classes, we are going to be passing this game class to all of them. So this tile map will be passed to the player, it will be passed to the enemy, it will be passed to the block, and it will be passed to the ground. Now, as I said, this game class contains style map and it contains a lot of other stuff. It contains events, like whenever you press a key to walk to the right to the left, the game class will handle that. It will handle the updates, right? In every frame, we need to update the graphics, right? So when we are moving from one place to another, we need a way to update all of those graphics that there is a movement. So we have an update function. And most importantly, since we will be passing this game to all of those players, it means now a player has access to the enemy, and the enemy will have access to the player. The player can see the blocks, the enemy as well can see the blocks. I mean everything can see everything. This is the beauty of having this design pattern. Now, in object-oriented programming, we have something called design pattern. And design pattern is going to define how the classes are interacting with each other. Now, the pattern that we are using here, and it's a pretty famous pattern in game design, it's called dependency injection. Now, you don't really have to worry about the name. I just wanted to give you that so that you know what pattern we are using. But at this stage, it's okay that if you just don't memorize it, but it's important that you know that at least. And dependency injection is when you have a main class and you are passing it to all of your classes. So right now, the player, enemy, block, and ground, all of them are in the game. There is more into this, which we will be talking about throughout this section, but this should summarize the architecture that we are going to use. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to create this game class and we will see how we can create a very simple map so that we can start programming. Now the first thing we need to do is to prepare our folder tree. It's a very simple thing we need to do. In the lecture, I have attached those files and the assets. We will be working with multiple files. A file that's called configuration, we have main, we have sprites and we have weapons. So we need all of those together. So create those five files using spider and make sure that the assets folder is with them. Now all you need to do is to actually go here in spider, go to this browsing directory and make sure that you have choose that same folder we have created where all the scripts and the asset folder is. Okay? And right now we are ready to get started. So here I am starting with a total new file. I'm going to just save it there. And right here I'm going to call this main. And here we go. This is my main. Now we need to install the libraries that we need first, right? To do that, just as usual, go to Anaconda. And we need to say pip install by game. Just as usual. And since I already have it, it will say requirement already satisfied. Okay, what is next? I'm going to create a new file here and i'm gonna call it configuration so here we go new file let's save it and we're going to call it configuration now configuration is going to contain all the fixed information like what is my screen size what is my tile size and the layering and the frame per seconds all of those fixed constants are going to be stored in configuration now it's really cool that we separate the project to multiple files and we'll learn how to do that for our big projects because this will make managing our complex program way easier. Okay, now we have two. Let's add one more file here and I'm gonna call it sprites. So new file, save it, let's call it sprites. And now we have three files. We also said that we need weapons, so I'm gonna create a new file again, save it, and let's call it weapons. Now, you might be feeling overwhelmed that we're having multiple files because maybe you have never done this before. But don't worry, everything will be explained in huge detailing. So now we have our assets folder containing all of our sprites, all of our tiles, and we also have our scripts ready. So let's get started with configuration. The easiest thing we can do is to define what is the window size we have. 
So let's say we are working with a window of maybe 800 by 600. This is just the width and the height of my uh, game window. Okay, so let's make it 800 by 600. Next, we need to define something called FPS. And FPS is how many frames per second are we are going to get when we are playing. And in our case, 60. Meaning that we will be flipping 60 images every second to get the feeling of a motion. Alright, for now, this should be enough. Let's go to our main. This is where the juice of the game is going to be. We are going to create a class and we will call it game. Remember, I told you that the main class here is going to be called game and we are going to pass it to all other classes like to the player, to the enemies and etc. Now, as usual, like every class, we need to initialize it. So we have diff in it and we need to pass here self. OK, now, what is the first thing I would like to do? Well, the first thing is the screen. So I'm going to say self dot screen is going to equal to pi game dot display dot set underscore mode this should be display we are going to set the mode here to win width meaning windows width and windows height okay we are getting an error because we, well we cannot really see where is that now let me save this configuration and take a look in order to import all the stuff that are in configuration, we can just simply from here say from configuration import store. Now this statement is going to go to the configuration file in a condition that the configuration file is in the same directory as my main file, which is right because we created all of those files in the same folder. And by saying that, you are simply indicating that you would like to import all the variables all the functions all the classes from this configuration this is why whenever we write this variable now it will be found even though we did not define it in this file like if i delete this right now you'll see that we will get an error anyway maybe this is an over explanation for this uh, import concept what's next we need to define something called the clock so we have self dot clock is equal to pi game dot time dot clock now, this one is the one that will be handling all of our frames per second. Uh, let me fix this. I think we need to fix this. Okay, right now we will be building this skeleton of our game. So we need a window. We need a clock. This should be enough for now. Let's create the functions that we need, even though we won't be implementing them immediately. So here I have define, create, tile map. This one will create our map, okay? And let's pass because I want it empty for now. Next, we need to create our sprites and our map. So right here, we are going to say create. And here, let's make it pass for now. This one will create our characters and we will add a lot of stuff there, which we will see later. Next, we have the update. Now, the update is also very, very important because it's going to update all the characters movements in every single frame. Okay, those are a must to have. Next, we need the events function. Now, the events function is the one that will handle our keyboard. Like when we press attack, when we press the arrows to walk around, all of that will be handled by the event. And next, we have a draw. Now, the draw function is the one that is going to draw all of our sprites on every single frame. So right here, I'm going to pass self and pass as well. And finally, we have the main, which will take care of all of that class in general. Okay, and again, we're going to say pass here. Now let's create a new game. So we'll see game is equal to game. We are instantiating our class. Then we will be saying game dot create, which will create our players, our map and everything. And right now I would like to add one more variable here and it's going to be called running. So I'm going to say self.running, meaning that the game is running, is equal to true. And whenever we are starting here, I'm going to say while game dot running, meaning that as long as running is true, I would like to be calling the main. So game dot main. Okay, otherwise I would like to break out of the loop and I will say by game dot quit and we need system exit as well. So I'm going to say here import sys and here I'm going to be saying system dot exit. Okay, so what did we do here? 
We created a game. It contains the screen right now. We have prepared almost all the functions that we need initially for our game. Now we instantiate this class. We create all the players and the map and we keep the game in an infinite loop. Now, a game should always be in an infinite loop because we are updating the screen all the time, we are listening to new events all the time. So this one should be repeating forever until we create a condition here to exit. In our case, we are going to say if running is false, like we will be setting running to false if we try to close the game, then we will break out of this loop and we will exit the whole game. So this is the skeleton. So far this does nothing actually. Now the next step is to create the, a very simple map and to add the functionality to be able to exit the game. Let's do that now. Now the first goal we would like to achieve is to actually create the map. You won't see it immediately because we need to do multiple steps to do that. Because as I said, whenever you want to build some really well-structured game, you need to spend time in the architecture before you can see some result. We need to build the map. We are going to put the map in the configuration right here. And let me show you how we can do it. I have already discussed what is a tile map and how we can uh, create it using a list. So I'm gonna say here, tile map is equal to, open a bracket like that, and let's start from here. Let's create a 20 by 20 map. It means that I have 20 tiles in width and I have 20 tiles in height. Let us indicate our tiles, the block tiles, where we cannot really have the player go over it with B. Those are the borders and some of the rocks that are around in the map. So we need 20 of those Bs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so this is the first 20. Now, you put a comma, and this will be your first row. Now, the second row will look like this. A block, and then an empty area. We also need 18 here. We need 18 here, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then a B. Okay, now put a comma, and just copy-paste all of that. How many times? We have two already, we need 18 more. So one, oh, let me copy it properly all here. Okay, two, three, four, and etc. Let's leave it at 14, actually. I'm not gonna make it up all the way to 20. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy this and just paste it here as the last row. Okay, so as you can see now, it is looking like a map. You have blocks around here and you have empty spaces where you can run around. Okay, so far so good. Let's put some blocks in between. So let maybe here, one, two, three, maybe here one, maybe another one here. As you can see, we can just do some really boring decoration. Maybe some blocks here, um, maybe two here, and maybe two here, and the one here. Okay, so the map will look something like this. That's it. Now, when we go further, we will be just replacing every one of those with a tile with a certain size. Now, instead of having to go pixel by pixel, every tile will have a size which we will be defining here. So here we are going to say tile size is maybe equal to 32. 32 by 32 pixels. Let me illustrate this to you real quick. So what we've talked about is that we have a map that looks something like this. And this map is, let's say, 20 by 14. All right? And we are dividing it into tiles. So right here, we have a tile all the way till 20. Okay, so this is tile 1, and this is tile 20. And every tile is 32 by 32 pixels. So this is 32, and this is 32. Okay? And this is how we divide it. So right now, whenever you want to build a map, you will just be putting squares all over the place. That ev and every square is going to be 32 by 32. This is what a tile is, and this is the map consisting of multiple tiles. In order to start drawing those tiles, let's start by creating that tile class, which is going to be called block. So right now, if I say class block, and notice here, we're going to learn a lot of stuff here. Every time you want to create a class that will be using the sprite properties of Pygame, you need to make it inherit from Pygame 
dot sprite dot sprite. This is the first step you need to do. Now you need to initialize it. So we need to say diff init and we need self. Sorry, we need self here. We need to pass game to it. Remember what I told you that every class is going to be passed the game in order to satisfy the dependency injection pattern. So here we have self, game, x, and y. The x and y are the location of that block. Now we are initializing it. Just as usual, whenever you have parameters that you are initializing, you just need to say self dot game is equal to game. You need to create some class variables for them. We have self dot x is equal to, what should x here equal to? Well, an x is going to equal to x times tile size. Remember that tile size we have created in the configuration? This is what we need because the x coordinate of any tile is actually relative to that block. Let me show you this. So when x is zero, we are at this block right here. This is for x equaling zero. Of course, we are starting from one as indexing, but let's stay consistent, okay? So this is zero, this is 19, all right? So from zero to 19. So this is block zero and this is a block 19. So in order to have that, when x equals zero, we need to multiply this by the tile size, whatever it is. So the coordinate here is going to be times 32 and it is equal to block zero. Now, when, when X is equal to one, we need to multiply it again. So we have X equals one, we multiply it by 32. And by that we can reach this block, which is 32 pixels away from the first block. So this coordinate here is now 32, which indicates that we are at block number one, right? So the distance right now between here, from here to here, is actually 32 pixels, right? And the second tile starts at 32. When x is equal to 2, we would go here. This is x equal to 2, right? But actually, as a coordinate, this one is here it's 0, here it's 32, and here it is 64, right? Because x actually, if you write it here, is actually equal to 2 times 32. See what's happening? This is why we are multiplying by 32. Same thing goes for y if we are going in this direction. So here we can say the same thing. We can say self dot y is equal, is equal to y times tile size. Now we did not import the configuration yet. So we need to say from configuration. Same as usual, import star. Okay, we still have a long run. Since we are inheriting from Sprite, there is some must to implement parameter. We must implement them because in inheritance, and especially when we talk about abstractions and interfacing, whenever you inherit from something and it is an abstraction class, you must sometimes implement methods or uh, variables. Okay, so what are some of those variables that we must or we, or we are forced to implement? Let's specify the width. So we have self.width is going to equal to, again, tile size, right? What is the width of that tile we have? It's actually tile size. Then we have self.height is also equal to tile size. Those are some important parameters that we might use because, again, this is my width, it's 32, and this is my height. Again, it's 32, so it's important to add those parameters as well. Now we need those images, right? So what we would like to do is to take an image and actually draw that on the block. Now, how can we actually draw that image? Well, we need to do something now in the main. Let's jump back to the main. We load all of our sprite sheets for the backgrounds, for the tiles, for the characters, meaning players and enemies here in the initialization. But how can we actually do that? What I want to do here, and bear with me, we'll say self.terrain underscore sprite sheet is equal to sprite sheet, which is a function that we are going to define in a minute. So here we need to pass where is this sprite sheet? Well, we need assets, images, terrain.png. Now I'm going to show you what is this. If we go to assets and go to images, now take a look here, we have some terrains. If I zoom in, we will see that we have all of those. Now what I need is I need a function that can go and get me any of those by just providing the first X and Y and what is the width and what is the 
height. Let me show you how we can do that. If you just open this with paint, as you can see here, down here, we have the coordinates, right? And since we are looking at 32 by 32, and we are looking at to create the blocks right now, we can go and choose any block we want. Let's say that we would like to take those rocks. If you take the select tool and just try to draw something here, you'll get its coordinates, right? So right here, we need around 32 pixels. Yes, it is now 32 by 32. Okay, let me zoom in a little bit. Now, if we are to take this square right here, we will see that we are at 991 by 541. And those coordinates are something that we would like to actually memorize because this is what we need to crop to create our block. So right now, we can write those down just as a comment so that we don't forget them. Well, at least right now we have added the sprite sheet. Now we will create the function that will crop. Let's see how we can do that. All right, so right now we need a function that can crop out our tile. And we will be using this function throughout our program. So it's really important to write it right now. It's not going to be a function. It's going to be just a class, actually. And we are going to call it Sprite Sheet. Okay. And this Sprite Sheet will have an initializer as well. So we have in it. And we need to pass to it self and path. And this will be the path for our Sprite Sheet. So right now we are going to say self dot sprite sheet just like that small letters is equal to by game dot image dot load then we need file and we need convert okay so when we do that we are loading that sprite sheet from its path as an image and we are storing it in a variable that is called sprite sheet now we need to define a class function so i'm gonna call this get image and then we need to pass self we need to pass the x where is the what is the x coordinate on the image and the y we have talked about this how we locate the x and the y and then we need to locate the width and the height so now let's locate the width and the height okay now we are going to return a sprite and a sprite actually is nothing but a surface so if you want to convert anything into a tile a sprite that is interactable in pi image you need to create a surface for it then you need to call a function that is called the blit that is going to put that image on the surface now all of this maybe is foreign to you so let me show you really quick so you have your sprite sheet, right? And it contains multiple images. We have one here. We have another one here, right? So the first thing we want to do is to actually locate that certain tile that we want to use or image. So we provide the X and the Y. So this is my X and Y for this point. Then we need to provide the width and the height. By that, we will be getting the borders of this image so that we can crop it out. So we take this image right now and we crop it and take it out like that. Okay, next. Now in Pygame, in order to display this on your window and be able to interact with it, you need to first create what we call a surface. And in our case, this is a Pygame surface, for example, like that. And then you would put that image on the surface, the image that you have cropped. And the way to put the image here is by a function that is called a blit. Okay, so right now we have blit this image to the surface and we're done. So this is the process of getting a sprite. We get the coordinates, we crop the image out, we create a surface, this white area here, and then we blit our image on top of it, and right now we can interact with it. So let's see how we can code that one more time. We will go to get image right here, and I'm going to be saying sprite, maybe, is equal to pygame.surface, this is the surface I was talking about, and surface actually takes two parameters, which are the width and the height. So you create a surface with a certain width and height, and this width and height usually will match the width and height of your image. 
it makes sense you make a perfect match of your image and you place it on your surface in some cases you might not want to do that but in most cases that's what you want to do now we can do the blit so we need sprite dot blit what do we want to blit well we want to blit the sprite sheet right so you loaded that sprite sheet you are now blitting that sprite sheet we are blitting starting at the coordinate zero zero and then we will be passing all the x the y the width and the height okay so this is the x coordinate on the sprite sheet right we have a large sprite sheet this is the x and the y the width and the height we just talked about that that defines the border of the image you want to crop and here you are saying that you would like to place that image on the surface at the coordinate zero zero of the surface we are going to say return sprite okay so far we are still seeing nothing because we don't have a ready to use product to show on the window but we will get there just trust the process so far now we can jump back to our blocks right here and we can do the following i'm going to be saying here self dot image is equal to self dot game dot terrain underscore sprite sheet then we are going to say get underscore sprite and we will be passing the coordinates we have saved 991 541 then we need the width so we need just to say self dot width and we need to say self dot height okay so what we are saying here we're saying go to the terrain sprite sheet which is right here which is an object from the sprite sheet right we have loaded the image because this is what sprite sheet does it takes the Im path image and then we are saying call the get image method and return a sprite to me on those coordinates and this is exactly what we are doing we came here and we are cropping out that block that we are creating we're putting it on a surface and we are blitting it next let us create what we call a rectangle so i'm going to say self dot rect is equal to self dot image dot get underscore rect okay since image is a surface right now right because well, we have returned a sprite here. If we go back, we are returning a sprite right here, which is basically a surface. Since we are returning a surface, there is a method for surface, which is called get rectangle. And by getting the rectangle, we are able now to get the x coordinate and the y coordinate of my rectangle. So we'll be saying self.rect.x is equal to self.x. And here self.rect.y is equal to self.y. Okay? So it's important also to know where is my rectangle. What is the x and the y of it? Okay? So all of those parameters are something that we must implement because we are inheriting. So see this template? We will do it for player, for enemy, for all of our classes that are bright based. And by that, we are almost done. There is few more things that we need to add. All right, so right now we are going to be talking about layering. Whenever you have a map, you are going to draw multiple things on it. You have maybe players, let's say the yellow is the player. You have some blocks around. You have some enemies maybe that are wandering around. So you are drawing multiple things, but how do you decide which drawing is going to be on top of on which drawing well this happens also in any photo editing program like in photoshop you have layers right where you can arrange which goes on top of which and this becomes extremely important when your game gets complex so you want to know what do you want to render first and what you want to render last like for example if i am to render the player first okay and let's say that i have rendered the blocks second then let's say I would like to render the ground last, right? So since the ground is a solid block, I'm going to be blocking all of those in one block like this, okay? This is my block. And I won't be seeing any blocks. I won't be seeing any players. I will be seeing nothing because I drone over it. So that's really not a good idea. That's why layering is very important. And Pygame has some built-in functionality that makes this very, very easy.
Okay, so let's see how we can do layering. Let's go back to configuration and let me define here something. I'm going to call it layer. So I'm going to say here blocks layer. And I'm going to set this to 2 and maybe ground layer will be set to 1. Okay, so first we render ground, then we can render blocks over it. Okay, so what would we do with these variables anyway? Let's go back to our block. We are still missing some key pieces here to, in our block. The first thing I want to do is to add the layer. And there is a variable that we are inheriting from the sprite, which is called layer. So if I simply just say self dot underscore layer, I could specify where should this block class be uh, rendered. Is it on the first layer, second, or whatever? So in my case, I'm going to go here and just say blocks layer, which is two. The key is all in this uh, underscore layer variable that we are inheriting from Pygame Sprite Sprite. We are not really done yet. I'm going to go back to main. We will be jumping a lot between those two files, but that's totally normal when you are building a pattern. Okay, so let's jump back here for a second. I want to go back to create. Create is going to be holding all of our sprites. So whenever we create a sprite, be it a block, be it a tile, whatever, just a sprite, I want to add it to the create right here. Okay, and to do that, I'm going to be creating a variable here. I'm going to call it self.all underscore sprite. So we have all sprites right now, and I'm going to say pygame dot sprite dot layered updates okay now you created a variable that you are going to add all the sprites to it and it is a layered update what does this mean it means that once you do this line pygame is going to handle all the layering updates one by one so it will handle the rendering order for you all you need to do is just make sure that for everything you have you create a layered update now we are saying all sprites class variable will be a sprite layered updates. Now what can we do with this? Very simple. If I go back to my block, simply, I'm going to be defining something here. So I'm going to say self.groups is equal to self.game.all underscore sprites. Okay. We will be passing this to the initializer of this sprite sprite so that we can add this sprite to all the sprites, okay? So as I said, we want a common place where we can add all of our sprites together. Now let's do this initializer. We are going to say underscore underscore init underscore underscore then self self dot groups, okay? Since you are inheriting, you can also initialize this inherited class, right? We are calling Pygame Sprite Sprite, this one. And we are calling its initializer, which accepts groups. And what's happening here when we call this self groups or pass it here, we will be adding every block to those groups. And we will be actually adding everything to those groups. Every sprite we will create, we will do the same thing. We will say init, we will pass groups. And this will be adding all of the sprites to the same place. Okay? This is why Pygame is very powerful as a library for 2D gaming design. Because it has a lot of built-in functionalities. Okay, so this is everything we need to do for the block. Now, how about I copy all of this and just paste it here. I know copy and pasting is not the best, but I just want to try to show you without overcomplicating the encapsulation of the program. Because I, I can encapsulate all of those in order to save the code space, but I don't want to do that at the moment. Because I want to explain in details what's going on. So here we have ground right now. And instead of blocks, I just need to say ground layer, which we have created in configuration a minute ago. And all of those will stay the same. Everything. As I said, once you create this, this will be a template that you will use for every class. Now, what you need to do is actually crop the right uh, image, right? This is very important. Let's go back. So what should be my ground? We can choose whatever 32 by 32 pixels. Let's choose this maybe. This block right here. This is at... Uh, one second. This is around 32 by 32, almost. So let's take a look at the coordinate. It is 447353. 
So those are my new coordinates. Let me go there and just modify it. So right here we are going to have 447 and here we will be having 353. Okay? This should be okay right now for the block and for the ground. Let me go back. Okay, we are almost done. Now we are going to see how we can create the tile map. Let's create a tile map. Right now we have all the components ready to create our tile map. And the way to do it is by going to this configuration, use a very simple for loop that will go over all of those row by row. If the letter is B, we'll be instantiating an object from the block class, or we'll be instantiating an object from the ground class if it's a dot. So the whole thing is about going row by row and then accessing each of those elements. I'm going to say here for i row in enumerate child map. Next, we are going to say for j column in enumerate row. Okay. Now we will instantiate the ground on all of them. Then we will be drawing the rocks over them. That would be better. And this will be a good use case to what I said here. Let me actually draw all the ground and then draw the blocks over them. That's really good practice. So let's say ground and well, we need to instantiate it. So we need self, j and i. All right. We are creating a ground object and that's it. Now I'm going to say here if column is equal to block, then I would like to instantiate a block. It makes sense, right? So block, where do I want to instantiate it? Self, j I, all right, we are instantiating ground. Remember, if you go back to that ground class, you'll see that it needs the game and X and Y. So when you are here, we are passing self and self means I want to pass the class I am in, right? So as I said, here it is waiting for a game. And since you are instantiating inside the game itself, you just need to pass the game, right? So it's self, it's the game itself that you are passing. This might be a new concept to you, but this is how it is. To pass the class itself to an object inside it, you just pass self to it. And then you need J and I, which are the X and Y you are waiting for. And then those X and Ys are going to be multiplied by tile size so that they are scaled correctly on the map. And that's it. This should be actually enough to start instantiating all the blocks for the ground and the blocks. Now we can go to create and we can actually create that. So we need to create the tile map. We need something to call this create tile map, right? And create will do that. So here I'm going to be saying self dot create tile map, right? In order to call a function that is inside a class or in order to call a class function, you just need to say self and the name of that function. And that's it. Now let's go to draw and see how we can draw all of that easily. So how can we do drawing? The first thing I want to do is to actually fill the screen with blackness. So I'm going to say just self.screen.fill and I'm going to be saying black. I don't have anything that is defined as black yet, but we can do that. So what we are doing basically here is we are calling screen. Screen is right here. And we are saying fill it with blackness. Now black is not defined yet, but we can do that. Black is a color, right? And a color is consisting of R and G and B channels. If we pass R0, G0, and B0, we would be getting the color black. Now we'll be talking about uh, color spaces a lot actually in image processing and video processing section but for now we are creating a tuple that contains r g and b when you they are zero you are getting black when they are 255 255 255 you'll be getting white any values in between is going to scan the spectrum for all the colors okay so we have created a pitch black screen now we want to draw the sprites how would we do that since we are working with Pygame, this cannot be any easier. Remember when we were going here and we were saying, hey, add those to the groups. Add all the sprites to the groups. So here I'm saying groups is equal all sprites and I am passing groups. Well, since everything now is in all the sprites, all I need to do is actually come here and just say self dot draw dot all underscore sprites. 
we already have that variable and just say draw that's it this is all you need to do but you also need to pass where do you want to draw them of course on the screen so self dot screen okay that's it now every time you add a player you add an enemy using this method i am doing here by creating a groups and passing it to the sprite initializer and then jumping back here to draw and just say draw everything it will draw it next when you draw you also want to tick the fps every time you draw something you want to tick the frame meaning that i have drawn this give me the next picture remember we are running at 60 fps meaning that every second we are ticking 60 times so we draw something that's a tick we draw again that's a tick we do that 60 times a second we get 60 frames per second we need to tick how do we tick we just say self dot clock dot tick and then say fps where is my clock remember this is one of the first thing that i have defined here now once you do that tons of stuff is going to happen in the background with by game now we still need to do one more thing which is called by game dot display dot update because right now we are drawing stuff but we want to see it on our display and to do that we need just to call display update okay this is for the draw function now in the update function which is also very important we are going to update any action that was done on our sprite so again we will call all of our sprites self dot all underscore sprites and just say update let's say that you changed where's the location of your player remember the player will be moving all around the screen so when you call update and since it is already in all sprites right so this is all sprites it's already in there now whenever something happens like this x changes the rectangle width changes or anything that happens this update is going to catch it by this update it will go over all the sprites and see if there is any update on any of them and since this will be running you update all the sprites you jump to the draw and you draw them after they are updated so two steps again you have a player it moves it means that the sprite has moved you call update to grab all of those movement and then you call draw to draw the new movement and then you display it on the screen and again the player moves again updates get notified that hey we got an update it grabs all of those updates again we draw them and we display them and this loop will repeat forever see how having an architecture is very useful it's amazingly useful when you are creating any complex game all right so we still have two things to fill we have events and we have the main once we fill them we will be getting our first window okay so right now we are going to work on our event for now we are just going to focus on exiting the window that we are about to create like we want to open the game and we want to be able to close it so closing the game is an event as well so i'm going to say for event in by game dot event dot get i'm going to say here if event dot type is equal to by game dot quit all I want to do is just say self dot running is equal to false. So we'll be listening for this by game quit, which is going to be triggered whenever you press the X, the close button on your window, and it's going to set running to false. This will cause this while loop to be false, and we will exit the main and we will be quitting by game. So what's left now after the event is actually the main. What should this main contain? Well, we are going to say here while self dot running. I'm going to be calling self event. I'm going to be calling self dot update, and I will be calling self dot draw. That's it. This is my main. We are constantly listening to events, constantly updating the sprites for any changes, and constantly drawing. This is what is it all about. Now we are going to start and run this, but I'm sure we might face some syntax errors and stuff. So let's behold and let the bugs come in. And that's the first one. Pi game is not defined. Yes, so in this uh, here we did not import pi game. So I'm going to say import pi game. Let's continue. 
size must be numbers so if we go here we have win width and the height all right so our problem here is that yes we have passed those but they need to be passed as a tuple most of the data can be packed as a tuple actually that's why we need a tuple here this is convenient what's the next one let's take a look no we're not done it says file is not defined let's go back oh it's path actually not file let's continue again we have another issue we could not find this path right here i think we have misspelled it here it should be assets now let's try again the ground is not defined because we did not import the sprites here okay so i'm gonna go here and just say import not not import from sprites import start like that let's continue again by game is not defined uh yes we need to import by game here again so import by game okay let's try again we're good here let's go to the main again we have no attribute get sprite it's called get image actually so let's go back here let's call this get image Uh, sprite sheet is not defined yes because this is a self dot sprite sheet because this is a variable that is in here actually again let's go back there and correct this uh where is it complaining now yes this one needs to be get an image let's continue and we're good this is our map right now but i think we have reversed what is ground and what is block so let me fix this i think we have mixed those up in the sprite and changed yes yeah we have changed the wrong one actually so this should be 991 541 and this one should be the other way around okay now let me try again and here we go as you can see right now we have all of those rocks and we have the grass well it's not really the best looking and as you see when we are drawing over the grass we are getting a black picture like there's a blackness here that's not okay what we want to do is we want this rock background to be transparent so that we can see the grass underneath it see why layer the drawing is important because we draw the grass first then we draw the rocks then we will be setting this transparency so that we can see what's under the rock as well okay now let us set this transparency if we go back to our sprite sheet right here i can do the following we can set what we call a color key so i'm going to say sprite.set.color key and then we can say black now this will take a look at the sprite and replace a certain color with transparency in my case whenever i see black in my sprites I want to replace it with transparency so if i just run this uh i think we have an issue oh okay this one is underscore actually not a dot let's try again and here we go now as you can see the rocks are being drawn over the grass that is really really great now you can build any size of a map you want actually and by that we have finalized our first section which is creating the architecture and as you can see now we have a solid architecture we can start from to create a more complex game and we have finalized the map as well okay so right now let us create our player so we have the blocks we have the ground but all of those are static there is no movement around so right now the real challenge is to create the player with all its features like moving, like colliding with the blocks, like colliding with the enemy, taking damage, colliding with power-ups and boosts, how can we do that, health bars, animation, we have a lot and tons to cover in this class. So we are going to create the class which is called player. And as usual, we are going to inherit from this, okay? We will be inheriting from pygame.sprite. Right, because this will make our job way way easier now the same thing we've done with ground we need to create the initializer first so we have diff in it and in this in it we have self we have game we have x and we have y 
we are passing the game to it and the position of that player. So far, so good. First, we need to say self.game is equal to game. And you know what? I'm going to save us time and I'm going to copy all of that. As I said, there is much easier way we can create a basic class and we can inherit from it. But I don't want to really do that right now. But you can do that on your own. That's totally okay. You can create a basic class and you can have block, ground, and player and whatever inherit from it. Because all of those parameters are the same. Okay, now let's delete this game and we have everything we need here. We have a layer, so we need to define a new layer for the player. So initially, we might change it. I'm going to say player layer that is rhyming is equal to three okay so we have a player layer right now so we can change this to player layer we have added this to all the sprites that's really good when it comes to layering we are going to introduce something new but not at the moment so for now it's enough that the groups is only all sprites later we will be creating groups for all the grounds or the blocks we are going to separate those groups including adding them to all the sprites this can be helpful later but for now let's keep it simple let's keep it that way we have the x the y the width the height now since this is a moving sprite we need to define something called x change and y change so let's define them here i'm going to say here self dot x underscore change initially is zero and self dot y underscore change is equal to zero so this one, whenever we move, we are going to change this exchange to some value so that we can have the character move certain steps. Now, there are more variables for the animation, but we will get to that once we created our animation. Now, we need to create the character sprite cheat, but how can we actually do that? Well, let's go back to the main and do the same thing here. I'm going to be copying this, paste it here, and change the name player underscores right sheet so let's go back to that folder now this is my character this is what we are going to use and this character sprite sheet is actually 32 pixels by 32 pixels now the x coordinates here are 0 32 64 and on the y we have 0 at this character 32 64 and 96 okay it's called cats so I'm going to say here for character, we have cats. This is all we need to do in the main. Let's jump back to our player and we need to change this. Let's change it to zero, zero. Okay. So initially when we are in the standstill, we are going to see this character right here. This is in our standstill mode. Okay. This first picture is at zero, zero and the width is 32. So we'll be cropping this first image. Now, do you think we can render this really quickly? Well. Let's try. If I go back to the main or to the configuration and maybe change one of those dots to P for player. And if I go back to the main and to the create tile map and say if you see a P, if column is equal to P, then maybe we can call that player. I'm going to say here self.player maybe is equal to player cell J and I. Okay, we are passing game and X and Y as usual just like here but here we are creating a variable also for it because we are going to use that later okay so if i run this uh yeah we are not getting the right picture because we are yeah let's go back to sprites we need to change this to character instead of terrain now we got some terrain weird picture so we have was it player maybe player sprite sheet right Okay, it is player. So let me close this, rerun it, and here is my player. It cannot do any movement, but at least we can see it. Now, how about we create our enemy really quick before we continue with the player, so that we can populate our map. Alright, so let's talk about creating enemies. We have created the player, and since we are populating the map right now, we can start by adding some enemies around the map. The first thing we want to do is go to configuration and initially we can add where exactly that enemy need to be. Now there's ways to do that randomly, but for now we are just going to specify exactly where is the enemy. So here we have one. So let's say that we have an enemy here, maybe another one here. 
and maybe another one I don't know let's have it here okay doesn't matter where we place them actually we need to create the enemy class so as I said this is a template that you are going to use every single time so let's just copy it paste it here and just call this enemy okay so we need to add a new layer right now for the enemy so let's go back to configuration and let's say that the enemy is on three and the player is on four so let's change this to four and this should be okay now we also need to change this sprite sheet because we want to get the enemy sprite sheet this time so let's go back to main and let's copy this line again and simply change this to instead of a player we need enemy small letters and let's go and check that image the enemy looks something like this okay so and the file name is evil.png so we can go back here and just call this evil okay let's jump back to sprites and change this from player to enemy now we are done with this class all we need to do is go to main and go to create tile map the same way we created the blocks players we will be creating enemies so i'll say here if column is equal to e self dot enemy we will say enemy and then say self j and i okay now if we run this here we go as you can see right now we have those enemies scattered around uh we are having a problem on the style let's see why yes yeah we need to add it to add this to be like this let's rerun it we close this and rerun and here we go we have three enemies they are motionless right now and the player that's really cool now let's go and add some movement to our player all right so let us work more on our player we want to work on movement so let's go here and define a new function for movement now if you go back to the main here you'll see that we have this event and i told you that all the keyboard actions are going to be here but i have decided right now that it's way better that we embed all of our keyboard actions right here in the class itself and only leave this events for the general game events like for example here quitting the game all right so let's go to sprites let me define here a function that is called move okay let's say self here and let's get started now in Pi game we can read what is being pressed on the keyboard using a function that is called key.getPressed. so if i say press is equal to by game dot keys not keys key actually dot get and we will see that we have get pressed this one will tell us what key we have pressed now let's identify the keys that we are going to use we will be using the arrow keys like left arrow go left right arrow goes right etc now let's say if pressed is and we would be saying by game dot k left now why would i use this syntax get pressed is going to return a dictionary and this dictionary has all the keyboard keys every dictionary value will be set to either zero or one so if you press the left key left arrow this dictionary value will be set to one this is why we are saying if pressed and a key here for the dictionary and checking if it's equal to one or not so this is equivalent to saying one right so if the left key is pressed then i will be saying here self dot x change is equal to self dot x change minus something that we call steps or player steps did we define that already no okay so what is this exactly to understand this we need to draw this on the blackboard this is my map it's important to know where are your coordinates. The coordinates are like this. This is X. And this is Y. And this is 0 on both. Okay. So as you go to the right, your X is going to be increased. 
okay this is by going to the right right as you can see we are on the axis we are increasing the x now if you go to the left what's going to happen well we will be decreasing x right now let's take a look at the up and down if you go down as you can see this is the zero we are going down y will increase and if you simply just go up y will decrease right we are heading towards the zero again so this information is very important when we are programming controllers okay now what is a step you can think about steps is the amount of pixels we would like to go whenever we press a certain key right so if i press right i would like to move three pixels like that if i press the right key if i press the left key i want to go three steps this way okay when i say i press the right key i need to increment x by a certain step when i press the left key i want to decrement x by a certain step now it's the same thing here if i go up i need to decrement y by a certain step if i go down i want to increment y by certain steps as simple as that so once you understand this map we can go and start programming that this is why we are saying we, if we are going left, right, we are decrementing some steps from X. But we need to define these steps. How many steps is the player stepping? So I will go here, maybe somewhere here, and just say player, capital letter, player steps is equal to 3. Okay, now we can continue for all the other direction. For the sake of animation later, I want to add one more variable here. I'm going to call it self.direction. Now direction is going to help me to choose which position of my character do I want to choose. You know, characters have multiple positions. When I press left, I would like to be saying that the direction is to the left. If I say right, I want the direction to be to the right. So I want to know in which direction I am at the moment when I press a key. So here's self-direction. Let's give it the default of, I don't know, right. So initially the player looks at the right, right? We, you can choose any default you want. Okay, so right now when we go left, I want to set direction to left, right? So we are facing left. Let's continue. I'm going to be copying all of this and pasting it here one more time. But instead of if, I want to use elif. Now if I'm not pressing the left key, check if I am pressing maybe the right key, right? So this is my right key. Check if it's pressed. Now right, if we go to the right, we are incrementing x, right? So we need to increment the chain and we need to change the facing to right so good now let me add one more for the i don't know uh, up direction if we press key up now i want to change the y not the x right so y change y change player steps but going up as we have seen is going to decrease y so we need to say here minus y because going up is going to the zero of the y, right? And of course, direction needs to be up. Now, if I say here elif and say down maybe, then y change here is going to be plus, right? Because going down is going to increment. And here it is done. Okay, so far so good. Is this enough? Not really. As I said, whenever you have some movement, unlike ground down the blocks because those sprites are not moving you need to implement the update method this is very important for when you go here see this all sprites update it's going to go to every class that is added to all sprite and it's going to trigger the update function of it so in our case we have a player we need to add this update to it so that it's get triggered for every loop okay so what are we going to call in this update well we will simply just call the move function we have just created right we need a way to call it and this is the way to call it we call it through the update which again is going to be triggered from the main right here because as you see update is being executed all the time and here we are checking for the updates for my sprites and here we are just triggering the update for all the sprites so just say self.move and that's it. This should be okay. Right now, let's take a look if this will work or not. So I'm going to run the game. It's already running, I guess. Let's, let me close it first. And let's run it. Now I am... Okay, so we got an issue here. Uh, has no attribute. X, yeah. All right. <laughs> this should be change. Ah, and we have copied and pasted this error everywhere. Okay, no problem. We can just fix it really quick. Okay, now let me rerun this. 
Now, as you see, we still have no movement because we are not really done yet. Jump back to Sprite and go to Update. What we are doing right now is that, okay, we are checking if we press anything. And all we are doing is just changing this exchange, which does nothing initially. What we want to do is we want to be able to change the rectangle of our sprite. So a sprite, as we learn, is a surface. And a surface has a rectangle. And this rectangle, we attach to it our image. So in order to move the character, we want to move the surface or the rectangle that is holding this image. So to do that, we will jump back to update. And you are going to update self.rect.x is equal to self.rect.x plus self.x underscore change. Okay. Uh, we have a typo here. Yes. Okay. Now, same thing for y, so self.rect.y is equal to self.rect.y plus self.x underscore change. Okay, so you are changing the location of the x by a certain amount. Now, after you have done that and changed it, I would like to reset this change. So I'm going to say self.x underscore change is equal to zero now, and self y underscore change also needs to be zero okay so we press a key change get a value let's say of three right because here right here we are saying increment this change by three so we are changing this value by three it means that we are moving this x by three on the update once we trigger this update in every loop now after we have moved this rectangle i would like to reset this change Right? Because maybe I'm not pressing anything anymore. So I don't want the effect to last. If I don't do that, if I press the right key, the character will keep going to the right without stop because this will keep accumulating every time I press the right arrow. And I can only decrement it by pressing the left arrow. And this makes no sense. What I want to do is I want to press the key. I want to change the location of the X and the Y of the rectangle. And then, and then I would like to reset the parameter that is making this change. Notice that we have change and we have rectangle. We are moving the rectangle by a change parameter, then we are resetting this change so that the character does not keep going. Okay, this should be better. Now let me test, but first I need to close this. Rerun. Now, as you can see, we are moving. Somehow I'm unable to move up and down. I'm only moving in a diagonal way. Let's see why. Yes, because right here we did not change this to Y. This needs to be Y actually. Let me rerun this. And let's try again. And here we go. We are going right, left, up and down. I have eliminated the diagonal movement. That's okay. I just want the four directions. But there is no collisions right now. And as you can see, the enemy is being drawn over the character. Okay. And... Yeah, we can go out of the screen as well, so because we don't have any collision yet. But control-wise, it's working. Since we are right now talking about movement, let's design the movement for our enemies. Right now, the enemies will not have any AI. They will be just moving to the left and to the right, maybe up and down, in a random way, okay? So there will be no intelligence about that, but it's important to see how we can even have the enemy move on its own without us interacting using the keyboard. We are going to define also here a new method, which is going to be called move, but this one is for the enemy. And we are going to create a direction before that. So I'm going to say here self.direction, and this time the direction is going to be random. So let's go and import a new library here, and it's called import random let's jump back here and just say random dot choice this is a cool function that we can use in order to choose one option from multiple options so let's say we have left right up and down we will use this randomized function in order to choose which direction the enemy is going to go now after we have done that we are ready to start programming some movement let's see how we can do movement i'm gonna just say here if self dot direction as equal equal to i don't know let's start with left what we would like to do if it's left i'm going to say self dot x underscore change 
is equal to self dot x underscore change plus enemy steps. So right now we are going to define the steps of the enemy. The same thing we did with the player. So let's say the enemy is a little bit slower than the player. So enemy steps may be equaling to 2. So with every loop we will be moving 2 pixels instead of a 3. This will give the illusion that the enemy is slower than the player. Because the player is already is moving 3 pixels for every keyboard key press. Okay, so let me jump back here and let me continue is the direction correct when we are moving to the left x is decreasing so i guess this should be minus right now let me continue i'm gonna go elif and if this is right of course i'm gonna be going to the right so we will be incrementing the x change let me continue now if this is i don't know up then we need to change here x to y right because we are going on the y direction when we say up and up is decreasing the y, right? Same thing here if we are going down right now. So going down is going to increment the y, right? Now we need an update method just like the player. So diff update. And for the update, we will do the same thing. Self.move. We will be calling the move for every update. And let me just copy those. It's exactly the same thing. We want the rectangle to be moving and then the change to be reset. Okay, now let's give it a shot and see what's going on. Let, let me close this and rerun everything. We have a problem here. Yeah, another type. Try again. And as you can see, the players are going out of the screen. Let me rerun again. And yeah, they are not changing direction. But that's totally okay. We can work with that. Let us add a counter that whenever we reach a certain amount of steps, we would like to call this direction again. Okay. Now let's create here self number of steps. So we have a certain amount of steps that we would like to choose between. So number of steps let's say initially is equaling to five we are going to develop this step by step let's see all the scenarios for what we can do for the enemy movement so let's say we are moving five steps okay and then we will change direction let's add another variable here call it self dot current steps how many steps did we step so far so right now here every time we go left i'm gonna say self dot current steps let's say plus equal syntax this time we will be incrementing this by one. This is the same as self current steps equal to self current steps plus one. Okay, so let me add this to all of those. Every time I step, I would like to do that. So this counter will count. Now, when we get to update, I want to check something. After I move and I reset the change, I'm just going to say here if self dot current steps is equal equal to self dot number steps. I would like to call this one more time. Okay? I will change the direction. So let's take a look. If I go to main right now and rerun, let's see the behavior. Now we still need to do one more thing that once this happens, I would like to reset the current steps. So I'm going to say self dot current steps is equal to zero. Now let me execute this and see what's going to happen. As you can see, the enemies are moving in a really they are moving right now but it's a really weird movement okay maybe we can increment the counter a little bit more so if i go back to sprites and maybe change this to 20 step and right now we should see a little bit more consistent movement yes as you can see the movement is a little bit more consistent but they are still too fast well if I go to configuration and change this to 1 maybe, and rerun, you'll see that the enemies are moving now a little bit slower. But 20 is still a little bit too low. Let me increase this to 40. Okay, now the movement right now is a little bit better. We are still not colliding, and that's totally okay. So as you can see, the movement is a little bit smoother. <clears throat> I would like to integrate... One more thing, maybe 
those enemies are just walking in some directions and then they are stalling so they don't have to keep moving all the time like this maybe move to the right stop move to the up stop like that so how can we implement this let's take a look so as we have noticed the enemies movement is now better but i want to add some stalling so that they move they stop and they move again and also i don't want them to all be moving and changing direction at the same time this does not seem too natural so how can we actually fix this well we are going to utilize a very simplified state machine we have talked about state machines before and they are just a way to decide what should the enemy do at this certain moment so we define something like state and just a variable and let's have two states one of them is called uh, moving and the other is called stalling so let's say that currently we are moving i'm gonna add a condition here saying if self.state is equal to moving then i would like to do all of those stuff that i have just done already which is moving left, right, up, and down. However, I would like to add now another state, saying that else or elif self.state is equal to stalling, then I would like to do something else. Let's say that we stall for a period of time after every left or right or up or down movement, and this period of time is going to be double the time that we are moving. So let's say here self.stall step. So we will be stalling for 80, for example. So we'll come here and we are going to say, if we are stalling, same thing. I would like to self dot current steps plus equal one, just as usual. Now, if self dot current steps is equal to the stalling time, so self dot stall steps, then I would like to be moving to moving again. So self dot state is equal to move. I will be moving one more time, okay? And I will be setting the steps to zero. So what we are doing here, if we are moving, we are going to move the rectangle to any of the direction. If we are not moving, I want to be keep incrementing that uh, stepping and wait until we are reaching the stalling steps. So if after this period of time, we will be setting the state back to movement, not move here, actually it's moving, so that we can continue in this section of the code. So Either we are in this section of the code, or we are in this section of the code, depending on the keyword we are setting. So initially it's moving, so we are in this block. Then if we are stalling, we will be in this block. But how can we set the state to stalling? Who is setting this state to be stalling? This will be handled by the update. I'm going to add a very simple condition here and say, if self.state is not equal to stalling, then I would like to say self.current steps is equal to zero so it's the same as this line actually we have already we already had it then i'm going to say self.state is equal to stop or stalling this is an if all right and that's it what did we do here well let's say we are moving in any direction remember we are moving for 40 uh, iterations once we have moved 40 iterations, if the state is not stalling, don't reset this counter. However, we will be setting a stalling. So the summary of this is that once we are done moving in any direction, I would like to set now the state to stalling. So that whenever I come back here, I will be executing this and I will be stalling until this stalling sets it to moving again. Then we are here. Once this is moving, we come back here, we wait for a certain amount of steps, then we set it to stalling. So these two portions of codes are moving forward and backward between those two states. Actually, let's change this to maybe 120, okay? Now, let me test this. Moving, stalling. Moving. Okay, they are not stalling anymore. All right, the problem is that here we are not setting this to zero. We forgot that. Okay, let's try again. Moving, stalling, moving, stalling, moving, stalling. And now the only ugly thing I'm seeing is that they are stalling and moving at the same time. Well, we can change this actually by changing for how many steps we would like to move. Okay, we're going to make this a random choice as well. How can we do that? Well, here, I'm going to be setting random.choice between multiple values. So let's say we might be moving less or more steps than 40. So let's say 
30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. We can choose any of those, okay? And right now, the same way we are choosing the next move randomly, the next direction randomly, we'll be choosing how many steps also randomly. Now, this should resolve our issue, hopefully. So let's take a look. As you can see, moving. Yeah, they are not like robots moving in one cluster anymore. They are just randomly moving around the map. And that's really great. This is way more natural right now. Of course, we still don't have collisions, which we will worry about later. Now we are going to work on our animation. All right, so far we were building the movement of our enemies and the player. How about we start with some animation? Let's go back to the player. We are going to start from the player animation first. And here we are going to say definition animation. Okay, self. Now, what is animation actually? If we open our picture, now let's say that we are moving to the left. As you can see, we have three pictures. If we change those three pictures at a certain rate, we are going to get a motion. So when I press the right arrow button on the keyboard, I'm going to be keep moving those pictures one by one, changing them one by one at a certain rate in order to get this motion feeling. And that's it. This is all about motion. All we need to do right now is to program it. So I'm going to create multiple lists. And every list is going to contain three pictures. Do you remember our sprite sheet function? Well, this is the one that we are going to use in order to extract those sprites. So we will be creating a list containing three sprites. All right, so let's open the player sprite sheet now. This is my player sprite sheet. So we'll start with the downward movement, left, right, and then up. Okay. So let's say down animation is equal to open a list and say self dot game dot character dot player underscore sprite sheet. Right. And then specify the coordinates. Well, the coordinates here are very simple because we have this is zero. Let's talk x axis wise. This is 0, 32, 64, right? Because each of those is 32 by 32 pixels. So we have 0 at this point, we have 32 at this point, and 64 at this point, and then the width is 32 and the height is 32, right? So we can just pass this information. The first sprite is at 0, 0, then we have self.width and self.height. You know, the width and the height are the tile size, which is 32. That's it for the first one. I'm going to copy and paste this one more time. So right now we are moving at the X axis, right? So this is my Y and this is my X. So right now the X is the one that is changing, right? Take a look. If we are looking at the downward, we see that we are reading on the X, right? We are reading horizontally for the downward movement. So here I'm going to... Keep the y at 0, and I'm going to change the x to 32, and I will do the same thing for the last one, by just changing the x again to be 64, okay? Now, let's only try the downward movement, then we will generalize this to all of those. Let's say this is the list for the downwards movement. I'm going to say if self.direction is equal, equal to down, meaning if we are going down, what we would like to do, we actually have two cases. Either the character is standstill, meaning we are not pressing any buttons, or the character is actually moving. Let's take care of the first case. So we have if self dot y underscore change and self dot x underscore change is equal equal to zero. Well, this one is also equal to zero, meaning that we are at standstill. So we'll say if self dot y change because we are in the downwards direction is equal to zero, meaning that we are pressing down, but we are not actually moving. And the meaning the last button I pressed was down. I want to keep looking down, right? In standstill, because the last thing I pressed is down. What I'm going to do is, well, just say self dot image is going to equal to self dot game dot player underscore sprite sheet zero zero self dot width and self dot height all right so we are saying that change the image to be if the last action was down and you are not pressing anything anymore 
I want to freeze this to be, I want the player picture to be this one. Now else, meaning that I am moving downward, but there is a change, meaning that I am moving, I'm not stand still. I'm going to be saying self.image is equal to down animation. Now we are going to choose one of those three sprites, right? But the way to choose it is a little bit new to you. So I'm going to say math.floor and then self.animation counter. Okay, so what is this self animation counter? Let's go and define it. Then we will talk about it. Let's go here and let's define self.animation counter equaling to, let's say, zero. Now, what is this? What's going on here? Well, initially, this animation counter is at zero, right? So we will be saying here math.floor animation zero. Now, flooring is actually a very simple operation. So if I say floor 25.0, Two, it's going to give me 25. If I say floor 25.9, it will give me again 25. If I say floor 30.1, it will give me 30. Okay, why would I use this? Well, you will see in a minute. Let me continue first, then I will re explain it. I'm gonna say here self.animation counter plus equal, let's say 0 0.2. Okay, or 0, let's say 0 0.05. All right, then I'm going to say if self.animation counter is larger or equal to maybe 2.5, I'm going to say here self.animation counter is equal to 0 again. Now, what is going on here exactly? As you can see, in every iteration, we are increasing this animation counter by 0 0.05, and we are flooring it. This will give us time to not change the frames too quickly. Remember that we are updating the loop very, very quickly in our main, okay? And it does not make sense that I change the frame, I change the picture of the movement way too frequently. Meaning that it does not make sense that I change these three pictures and keep flipping them between each other like 60 times per second. This is way too fast. So I'm using this counter to decrease of amount of change. Like we are incrementing, so we are incrementing by 0 0.05, so it will, so the first iteration it would be 1.05, this will be floor to 1, then 1.1, this also will be floor to 1, all the way to 9.5, this also will be floor to 1, until we are at 2.0, then the index here is going to change to 2, then it will be 2.05, 2.1, also the index will stay 2 because we are flooring it, all the way until we reach say 2.5 okay actually it makes no sense here to have it at 2.5 let's make it at 3 actually and maybe change this to i don't know 0 0.1 okay because these need to be whole number anyways this is what a counter is and once we reach 3 meaning that we have displayed three frames i would like to go back to zero let's test this out but before that we just need to add this to the update right because how can we call this function again always from the update I'm going to just say here, after we move, self.animation. Now, if we run this, let's take a look. We have an error. I think we forgot to add get image. I need that as well. Yeah. Now, let me try again. Okay, we're still having an issue. Yeah, another typo. Let's see if we have any more bugs. Uh, download. Yeah, we need self here. Self.downward animation. Again. I don't think this was the issue here. We don't have self in the down animation because this is just an internal variable. So let's see. Down animation is not defined. I think we have a typo here as well. So this down. Math is not defined. Let's import math. And here we go. Uh, we got this one more time. Yes, because we need get image here as well. Okay. I think this should be it. As you can see, we are moving downwards and we can see the animation of the player. Let me try again. We, go, we went up. Now let's go down. And as you can see, we are moving down. We can play with this to make it faster or slower. So maybe if we reset this to 1, let's see if this will be any better instead of 0. Let me try again. Ooh. 
Well, this is a little bit better. Now the movement is a little bit consistent. But I think we can make it a little bit faster. So actually those need the tuning. So this is why. So if I make it maybe 0 0.2, now it's even much better. OK, so I like this tuning right now. Let's move this back to 0. Let's try again. Yeah, that's good. All right. So let's generalize this to all the direction. I'm going to fast forward here because I don't want to repeat myself a lot. Now, as you can see, all we've done is we have created left animation, right animation, and up animation. And the only difference is we are keeping the exit change as it is. So it is 0, 0, 32, 64, 0, 32, 64, because, well, this is 0, 32, 64, and we are only changing the y direction now. So right now we are at 32 for the left, 64 for the right, and 96 for the up. So this is left, right, and up. We are just giving the far left coordinate of every sprite. Okay, now I will also do the same thing for the direction here. I'm going to be copying all of those and do all the directions. Left, this is up. This stationary state will be 0, 96. So for up, this is the stationary one that we need when we are not moving. Or, you know, maybe we can take this one. It, it looks more standstill than the other. Change this to up. Now let's do the same thing for the left and the right. Change this y to x. Choose a picture for the left. It makes sense that we take this one. So this will be 32, 32. Change this to left. And we're good. Now let's do the same thing for the right. Again, x direction. Best image is this one. So this is like 32 by 64. Change this to right. And that's it. Now let's test this out. Now we are going right, that's really good, going left, going up, going down. All the animation is just going perfectly well, right? That is really great. Now let's do some enemies animation. How about we reapply the same process in order to animate the enemy? Well, I'm going to be copying this whole function. And I'm going to be pasting it in the enemy class. Just like this. So we have now animation for the enemy. We only need to change this from player to whatever variable we have here. So we have called this enemy sprite sheet. So we need to change all the player here with enemy. All right, now let's make sure that the coordinates are the correct ones. So we have down, left, right, and up. So here also we have down, left, right, and up. And I think they are with the correct order. Okay, now here also we need to change this to enemy for all four directions. And we also need to define animation counter variable as well as the direction. I think we already have the direction, right? Yes, we already have the direction. We just need self dot animation counter equaling to one initially. Okay, now let's see if we have forgot anything. Let's test this out and take a look. Let me close the old one. Rerun. Yes, we forgot one more thing, which is adding this to the update. So we need to go to the update of the enemy. It's right here. And we are going to say self.animation. And we will rerun all of this. And as you can see right now, the enemy is changing direction 
Well, that's really good. All right, so as you can see, the enemy is changing direction right now as well. They are moving. That's really, really nice. And they, are, they seem like they are looking around all the time. If we take a look right now at the enemy, I really don't want to change direction when we are stalling. So maybe we will add this random choice of changing direction only when we are not in stalling. Okay, so let me try this again. This maybe will reduce the amount of rotations the enemy is rotating when he is not moving. So let me close this again and restart to see if this will have an impact. Actually, yes. Now the enemy is rotating less when we are in standstill. We can also notice that the enemy is walking, then he is rotating immediately to the direction the enemy is going to go through in the next iteration. Maybe this is not a very good idea. Like it stalled, it went left, and now we know that it is going left. Now it is also going left. Now we see that it went right, then it is moving right. Maybe we need to work on this as well. So let's go back here and see when we are taking the decision to actually rotate. So I'm going to be taking this whole statement again. See, this is like iterating to get the best behavior of the enemy. So I'm going to cut that, all of it. Go back to the move and maybe change direction only when we are moving, actually. Right? So when we decide to move again, we are going to change the direction. So let's take a look again. Maybe this will be better. Enemy stopped. Then they are changing direction. This is way better. Okay. This is less predictable right now. We don't know where the enemy will go in the next iteration because it's changing its direction only when it starts moving. All right, so we are through with animation. Let's go to some collision. Collision is actually a really fun topic. And it's basically about whenever we have our player hitting a rock right here or hitting the enemy. Whenever we have our player colliding with this rock, I don't want the player to be able to uh, walk further or pass that rock. Or even overlap with the rock like the situation right now. Or maybe when I collide with the enemy, I would like to lose health points or maybe die, right? So let's see how colliding exactly works. Let's say that we have two sprites. This one is my, I don't know, my block. And I also have my player. Remember, everything is a rectangle in Poi game. Right? So this is my player and this is the block. How a collision works is that there is a function that is going to check any two edges of those rectangles to see if there is a collision. Like in my case, if I am approaching this block from this side, from the left side, the collision is going to check this edge right here with this edge right here. So it's really, really important to understand those edges in order to be able to program collision, right? So here we are going to check this edge with this edge and see if they are overlapping with each other, right? So maybe now the player is going to be hitting this edge and we can check those two edges together to see if they are overlapping. Or, or maybe we are colliding from these two edges, like the bottom edge of the block and the upper edge of the player, right? We just need to check all of those cases. So let's see how we can program that. Now let's start with our player and create some colliding with blocks, all right? So I'm going to create a new method, define collide with a block. So whenever we collide with a block, we are going to call this function. Since we are moving the player with the keyboard, it's an easier case than the one when the enemy is moving on its own. So let me show you. First, we are going to read what is the key being pressed. So pressed is equal to pi game dot key dot get pressed. Just we've done this before and we would like to know what key is being pressed. OK, now I'm going to call a function here, which is going to check if two things collided or not. So I'm going to call this collide is equal to pi game dot sprite dot sprite collide. OK, you need to pass two sprites to check if they have collided or not. Well, now grouping is going to be very, very useful. Look, we already have all the sprites stored in one place, right? Take a look here. We have already this all sprites variable and create this one. And every time we have a new block, new player, new enemy, we are adding it here. That's really good. This is very useful because 
we are updating all of those sprites all at once. But let's say I want to check if I am colliding with any block. How would I do that? Like right now, I want to check if the player is colliding with the block. So I can just say self, meaning that just take a look at self, meaning that check if the player, which is self in my case here, is colliding with a block. But how would I check the block? Where is the block? How would I pass it to the function right here in order to check collision? Well, this is what we are going to do. We are going to create a group of sprites and we will check if we are colliding with any of those blocks. All right. So how can we do that? Well, let's go back to the main and specifically to the create section. And I'm going to say self dot blocks is equal to pygame.sprite.layered update. I'm creating a new group right now. And this group is called blocks. So every time I create a new block, where am I creating blocks here, right? Every time I create a new block, I would like to add it to that group of blocks. How to do that? Well, go to sprites, go to blocks right here. And now self.groups is not only all sprites. I'm going to add one more thing, which is self.game.blocks. Now, what I have done is I have added all the blocks uh, as well. Every time I instantiate a new block, I am adding it to this game of blocks group, which is this one. Okay. Now, when I am trying to check collision, I can check against every block to see if I am colliding with it or not. See, this is really, really easy right now. So how can we do that? Well, all we need to do now is just say self.game.com blocks that's it now we are checking self meaning the player itself because this method is already a player method so we are passing the player sprite and checking if it's colliding with any block from that group now there is a true and false flag that we need to indicate here and this is very useful because right here you are saying if the player collided with that block should the block disappear or should it stay as it is in my case i don't want the block to disappear actually now there is a lot of cases where you want the sprite to disappear let's say you collided with an enemy and you die you would want maybe your sprite to disappear or maybe you are collecting some stuff or power-ups from the ground when you collide with that power-up you would like the power-up symbol to disappear right in that case you just pass through okay now how do we check if there is a collision or not from this function it's very simple you just say if collide so this collide is going to return a true or false so now if collide what we would like to do i'm going to say here if press by game dot k let's say that we are colliding from the left what should we do exactly here if we are colliding from the left well let's take a look look this is my player and i'm colliding from the left of the block okay so i'm going to the left and there is a collision in order to stop the player from moving we need to understand what is movement movement when we press the left arrow as we have programmed it it is progressing and going to the left by three pixels right so every time you press left you go three pixels three pixels now whenever there is a collision i don't want to go three pixels anymore right what i would like to happen is whenever there is a collision i would like to negate those three pixels that i have moved right that's it so whenever you come here and there is a collision all you need to do is just increment the coordinates of the player rectangle by three instead of decreasing it right because now we are going to the left meaning y is decrementing by three pixels when we collide we just increment it by three pixels so that we cannot progress anymore Okay, that's it. This is all you need to do. What happens if we are approaching the block from the right? Well, in this case, progressing from the right is about increasing the x of this rectangle, right? Because going right increases the x coordinate. When we go right and collide from this side of the block, what we would like to do is to decrement the x by 3, right? Because going this way, we increment it, but since there is a block, we don't want to increment anymore, so we just keep decrementing so right now the summation is zero meaning that we cannot progress anymore because the pressing right will add three and collision will subtract three and by that we will be stuck near the block same logic would go if we are going from this side or from this side so as we said if we are going left we're going to say self dot rect dot x plus equal player okay 
and going the opposite direction, let's say from the right, is going to decrement. So let us test this out actually. I'm going to close this and reopen it. Let's try to collide from the left. Oh, <laughs> one second, we did not call collide yet, as usual. Alright, so I'm going to get this collide block and add it, of course, to my update. So I'm going to add it here, self. Okay, now let me try again. Let's try to collide from the left. And as you can see, yeah, we have an issue. Somehow, all right, the dot was not typed correctly. All right, now let me try again. Now let's take a look. As you can see, we cannot progress anymore. Let's go and try a right collision. Again, we cannot progress anymore. That's good. Let's go here. We cannot go. So right and left are just working. Okay, that's not so bad. Now let's add the up and down as well. It's the same concept. So we will be taking this. This is just up maybe. And for up, we would like to increment, right? Because going up usually will decrease the y coordinate, right? Because the y, when we go up, you approach zero. So to negate that, we would be incrementing instead of decrementing. Okay. And instead of x here, we need y. And finally, we need to do the same thing right now for down. So if we are going down, I would like to do this. Okay. We will decrement. All right. This should be it. Now let me test those as well. So if I go up, we cannot go anymore. Down. As you can see right now, we cannot go left anymore. Go right anymore. That's really good. Up. Down. Now the collision we created is working, but it's not really that perfect. Let me show you why. So if I am to run the main, take a look here. If I try to pass through those, you'll see that I cannot. Why? Because maybe one of the pixels of the character is already colliding with the square of my rock right here. And that's really not good because right here, the rock, is taking 32 by 32 pixels even though the rock is looking smaller than 32 by 32 it is still actually considered a 32 by 32 so to resolve this we are going to do something about it we are going to add a parameter for partial collision partial overlapping between two sprites or two rectangles to simply do that we are going to go to our sprites and to the collision section and i'm going to add one more parameter if i say by game dot sprite dot collide underscore rec underscore ratio and then let's say that the ratio of collision should be maybe 0 0.5 okay let's take a look how will this affect our game i'm gonna close this and i'm gonna reopen it now take a look now i can come closer to the rocks as you can see now here maybe this is not really that good because we are coming a little bit over the rock but at least Let's take a look at this passage where we were not able to pass. Now we can simply pass it. But the ratio we have is a little bit aggressive. So maybe we can change it a little bit. Maybe raise it to 0 0.85. Okay. Now let me try again. Now if I try to go over the rock, you'll see that this is good. And yeah, this is really good. One more thing that I have done is actually I have changed this from ifs to elif because I really want the collision to happen only on one of those, not at two edges at the same time because this will complicate things a little bit. This is why I have changed it to elif. And yeah, I think this is much better right now when we add some percentage for collision. Okay, how about we collide with our enemies as well? So if I come here, and just add another collision. So if I say definition collide enemy, okay? It's a very similar function or a method in our case. I'm gonna be copying all of those, adding them here. The same way we have added all the blocks to a group, I'm gonna be doing the same thing for the enemy. So right now, if I go to the main, 
go to create and now I'm going to be saying here self dot enemies is equal to by game dot sprite dot layered updates okay now we have a new group which is called enemies let's go back let's go to our enemy class and we will add that as well so i'm going to say here self dot game dot enemies now all the enemies whenever we create a new enemy it's going to be also stored as a sprite in this sprite group which is called enemies okay now if we go back to collision we can start implementing this we will say if a player which is self collided with enemies of any enemy then the same thing would happen okay so let us give it a shot and see what's gonna happen if i run this let's go to one of the enemies oh <laughs> again the same thing we forget every single time which is calling collide enemy in the update i keep forgetting this so self dot collide with enemy check for the collision with enemy as well let's try it now as you can see i cannot really go past the enemy anymore that's really good let's try another one that's good we cannot really get past the enemy anymore but the enemy can step on us actually that is something different now we are taking from the perspective of the player to the enemy but if the enemy decided to walk and it approaches us it, and it tries to surpass us it's going to be a drone over our player right because we have accounted only a player to enemy relationship not the other way around but this is solvable and we will solve it later when we get to the enemy collision okay so far so good what we want to work on right now is the enemy collision well how can we do that an enemy can collide as well with all of those blocks we don't want the enemy to go out of the border of the game right so let's do that and let's see if we are going to face any challenges while we are implementing let's go to the enemy it is actually here here's the enemy and we are going to say definition also collide blocks okay or block we'll see what this function will do now it depends on the direction that we are coming from right so right now we are going to say collide again is equal to by game dot sprite dot sprite collide then we have self we have self dot game dot blocks right we want to collide with the blocks and false we don't want the blocks to disappear once we touch them now we are going to say if collide what are we going to do it depends on the direction right so if self same thing dot direction is equal equal to left what we would like to do remember what we have done already with the block is that we are moving the rectangle of that enemy according to those steps so maybe i can just copy all of that and paste it down here with minor changes of course so here instead of pressed we actually looking for the direction so self dot direction is equal to left same thing here self dot direction is equal to right then instead here we need up and we have down okay and in the update just as usual we check for collision self dot collide blocks i mean intuition tells us to do it the same way let's say uh collide collide not collide 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 block okay so let's see if this will work main here we go the player all right colliding and unable to go good good and we also we don't want this jittering effect whenever the enemy is actually walking repetitively over the rock okay we need to solve this so maybe if we are going left we would like to go right so here when we are colliding from the left i'm gonna say self dot direction is equal to right okay we are just trying to force the enemy to go in the opposite direction 
when it's right, when we are colliding from the right, we'll say self.direction is equal to left. Okay, let's test these two scenarios out. That's good. As you can see, the enemy here hit the rock and it went back to the other direction. Let's continue observing. Now, the up and down need to be fixed, so let's fix them. And this one bounced as well. That's really good. So let's fix the up and down as well. All we are doing is that when we are colliding to the right, change the direction of the enemy to the left. It's a really simple solution. So self.direction is equal to down. And here, self.direction is equal to up. Okay. Now let's test this out. And you know what? I'm going to increase the number of enemies a little bit. So maybe I will add one here. I will add one here, one here, maybe one here. Okay, now let's observe this. See if we will have any issues. Yes, the enemies are still going over each other. That's totally okay. But collision wise, we are doing okay. They are hitting the rock and then they are just changing direction. That's good. So since right now we have some basic functionalities, let's improve our scenery a little bit. How about we add some water that we cannot actually cross? Well, first we need the coordinates of this water. This seems to be at 8. Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, so if we take a look here, we will see that we are at 865 by... 160 okay this is the coordinates of the water so let's get that i'm going to go to the sprite and right now i would like to create a new block similar to the ground and to the block and this one's going to be called water okay let's call this water and we need to create a sprite sheet for that and the sprite sheet we will be using is the is the terrain one, right? But this time, we are going to change the coordinates. So instead, we are going to say the coordinates we have written down, which are 865 and 160. Now, this should improve the scenery a little bit. Uh, I think we forgot to copy something here. Let me copy these three lines and yeah, here we go. Okay, so now let's go back to the configuration and add some water area. So maybe we will add some water area around here. Water is going to be R for water because W is already for weapon. So maybe we can have R right here, R right here, some R right here, maybe right here. Maybe we can have some here just to add more elements and make the map a little bit better. Okay, so now if we go back to the main, we can simply here say if column is equal to or then maybe we will say water self j i okay now let me run this and see what's gonna happen as you can see now we have some water area but we can walk over so what we want to do is make this water area non-walkable that's one thing and we can also animate this water a little bit right now it's a still right we can add some animation to it. How would we do that? Well, let's work on the water animation before we make it unworkable. So if we go to the same animation concept we were using, we had some animation like that, right? We had a list for that. And we'll do the same exact thing. I'm just going to copy this whole function so that I don't have to rewrite it. And I will go to water right here and I'm going to create diff animate or animation self let's create animate list okay and this will be the first one coordinates the first coordinate is the actually 865 and the 160 now if you take a look all the three waters here are next to each other so we are only moving on the x-axis 
okay so this one is 865 this one is 865 is plus 32 it should be around 897 and the y is the same okay so let me add this one first this is the second one so this will be 97 and the last one which is going to be plus 32 it's going to be 929 okay so this is my animation list now let's go back and see how we did it it's the same concept as i said there is no stand still we only have those so if we go back to the water we can just apply the same logic we need to create self animate counter so we can just add it here self dot animate counter is equal to one and we can have the same thing we need an update so we need definition update because now it's moving it's not like those blocks where nothing is moving we have some animation and anything that is moving needs the update method so we have here self and we're just gonna call animation okay self animation of course let's fix this a little bit now we need to fix this one and change the name here to animate right let's see if we are going to get any animation or we are missing something uh, water does not have animation counter oh it's animation counter not animate counter and here we need to change this to terrain instead of player okay this should be it hopefully so let me run this as you can see right now we have some moving water but it's moving way too fast we can adjust this by making this maybe 0 0.01 for example let's see if this will be any better yeah it is better but there is some shifting in the coordinates all right so let's go and take a look exactly where is the location of that i'm gonna zoom in all the way it's at 864 so maybe trying at 864 and decreasing everything by one pixel let's take a look if this will resolve anything this is much better as you can see right now it seems like we have some water around here much much better okay now let's make this water unwalkable to do that the same way we made the blocks unwalkable we are going to imitate that exact same way so go here and let's create water self.water we are going to create a group here and let's go to the sprites and as usual just add this to the group so self.game.water now all the water is in the same group and we can have collide water for any of those or if you want the exact same behavior as water well we can actually just add it to the block it's really up to you Maybe you want your character to drone whenever you are near the water. Maybe you want to treat it like just a regular block. So let's treat it like a regular block initially. So collide block. So this one I'm going to call it collide, I don't know, block. And I'm going to add another one like that. And maybe I will increase this to 90 and i will add here game water and this one will be collide water so i'm going to say here if collide block is true or collide water so it doesn't matter where is where the collision happened okay so right now i'm going to go to main and let me test this out as you can see i cannot walk and water anymore right that's really good now how about we add the same thing to the enemy to do that we just go to the sprites again go to the enemy and go to the collide block and just duplicate the exact same thing i'm gonna copy this paste here and just say here instead of blocks we will say water and here we will be saying blocks and here we will be saying water same thing here if we have a collide blocks or we have collide water 
okay now let's take a look what's going to happen as you can see it's stopping here and it's not even continuing well that's really good now we are improving this scenery this should be okay for now the only thing i want to do is to expand this map a little bit so i want to make it way larger than this so i'm going to go all the way like this okay so this means we will be incrementing this like that and all the others let's shift everything let's expand it in height as well so maybe i will just copy an empty one almost empty one and let's add them okay now we can create some really nice waters around here so maybe this whole area is just full of water okay so let me now rerun this as you can see now the map is way bigger but the reason I wanted to show you this is that right now we cannot see beyond the window. So maybe we need some sort of camera that is going to actually follow the player whenever he goes. Okay, and that is our next topic. Let us implement some camera. Now a camera is going to follow the player wherever he goes and that's really a good thing once we have a large map that we would like to explore. So let's go back to our main and we are going to create a new function now, a new method, and it's going to be called camera. Now there is multiple camera accounts that one can apply. And the concept that we are going to do is that whenever we are moving, we are going to move all the sprites with us. So bear with me right now. I'm going to be reading what I am pressing first because I'm going to be moving all the movable sprites around me accordingly. So here I'm going to say by game dot key dot get pressed okay now if pressed is by game underscore uh k left for example now if we press this key what i would like to do is i'm going to iterate over all of my sprites so i'm going to say for i for counter sprite in enumerate self dot all underscore sprites and then I will say sprite dot rect dot x plus equal player step. Okay, so I am getting all the sprites and moving them along with me to give the illusion that my camera is moving. Okay, so I'm gonna do this for all the keys right now. So we have right, this should be minus, we have up. For up we need a y and we need to be incrementing. Of course all of those are elif, so else if. And we have finally the down. And this should be minus. Okay, now I have already added the camera here, so I have already added the camera here. You need to call it in the main, in the while loop. Now let me test this out. So as you can see right now, everything is moving along with me. That is really nice. As you can see right now, we are moving the camera. But here is the bug that we will face. If we collide, the camera will keep moving and that's not okay. So let me solve this really quick. The problem is, whenever we are hitting the collision, we are still moving everything. What I want to do here is to check if we have a collision, okay? So I'm going to be creating a very simple variable here, self.collided. I'm going to call it like that. So if there is a collision, this one will be set to true. So right now I'm going to say here only if self.collided is equal to false, then I would like to do all of those camera actions. 
Who is going to set this collision to true? Well, if we go to sprites and we go to the player collision, so this is my player, this is the enemy, this is the player, okay? And we will go to the collide block. Now, if there is a collision, then I would like to set that to true. Self.collided is equal to true, okay? Otherwise, if there is no collision, so I'm going to say here else, self.game.collided is equal to false. This should be game as well, because we are accessing the game variable, right? This variable that we have just created up here. We are accessing it and changing its value. So whenever the player is colliding something, we don't want to shift any of the other sprites. We want the camera to stay still, okay? This should solve it, okay? Now, let me rerun this. Let's try to collide here. As you can see, the camera is not moving. And that's really good. Let's try with the water. We are not moving the camera once we have collided. This solved it. This is really, really nice. And now we are... And now, as you can see, we are enlarging our exploration. We can go to a whole world. We can design this whole world in a better way actually so that we can have more adventures we can have more stuff to pick up and next we are going to see how we can create some attacks and we just found another bug when we are colliding with the enemy actually we are not considering it as a collision so let's go back to the sprite and go to the enemy collision and do the exact same concept so if i am colliding with the enemy I would like to do the same thing I can say here else self dot game dot collided should equal to false let me rerun this to test it for the last time let's try to collide with an enemy and here we go the camera is actually stopping All right, so right now what we want to do is if an enemy touches the player, we would like the player to die. So that's a good practice actually to make the game end somehow. Starting this point, we are going to design some health system, damage system, and all of those, and weapon systems, power-ups, we are going to work on those. If we go back to the main, I'm going to create a layers group here for the player. So I'm going to say here self dot main player i'm gonna call it like that is equal to pi game dot sprite dot layered updates okay now i'm gonna simply go back to sprites and i am in the enemy class right now i'm gonna add a new method and this method is going to be called collide player but there is one more thing that I need to do as well. If I, I need to go back to the player and add him to that separate group. So here I'm going to be saying self.game.main player. And by that I have added to that group. Now let's go back down here and let's do that collision. I'm going to be just saying here collide as usual is equal to I'm going to copy all of that I don't want to rewrite it and here we are checking if we are colliding with the player so with main player and if a collision happens I would like the player to disappear so if an enemy hits the player the player will disappear and that's it this is all we need to do this is the only line that we need now let me test this out if I go and touch an enemy, oops. okay, we need to add this to the update as well. So I'm going to be saying here self.collide underscore player. Now let's test this. Let's go and hit an enemy and we disappear. Now we need to quit the game maybe whenever that happens. So that would be a good idea. So I'm going to go here to sprite and if this happens, I'm going to be setting self.running is equal, not running, game.running is equal to false. This should cause, actually, the whole game to halt, okay? But first, we need to add a condition, if collide. So if, we, if there is a collision, I would like to stop the game from running, and we will quit the game. 
So let's try it now. And the game is over. This is a one hit kill actually. There is still no damage or no health system. Which we will be creating right now. How about we have some fun actually. And create a health bar for our player and the enemies. This would be a really nice addition to the game. And we will learn how we can do that. Well, a health bar is going to be also a separate sprite class, okay? Now, we can embed it to the player, of course, but, well, why not make it separate? It will be easier to manage it, since it's a drawing on the screen, separate one. Let's see how we can do that. I'm gonna go to sprites and create a new class. I'm gonna call it a player health bar. So I'm gonna say class player underscore health bar. And as usual, it will inherit from by game dot sprite dot sprite. Okay, we need to initialize this init self game x and y. And let's go and copy the template actually, and not bother with rewriting everything. We will do some modification to this template, and you will see what we are going to do exactly in a minute. So, first, layer. Let's create a new layer over there in the configuration, and I'm going to call it uh, health layer. Okay, all the health bars, be it for enemy or for the player, is going to be here, and it's going to be at 5. Okay, so now we have a health layer. Let me add it. Let me add it here. It's going to be health instead of player. And that's step 1. Next, the height and the width of the health bar is of course not going to be 32 by 32 pixels. And we also would like maybe the health bar to be a little bit far away. So maybe here the width will be around 40 and maybe the height will be like 10. Because after all, a health bar is nothing but a green rectangle. Now, how can we create a green rectangle? Let's go to the image initially. We also need to delete this because we don't have any change. The image here is going to be a surface direct. Because here we don't actually have any images, any sprites. We just need to create a green rectangle. To do that, we just need to say by game dot surface. We are creating a rectangle as a surface. And we need to specify its width and height. So self dot width and self dot height. Okay? This is how we create a rectangle. Now to give it a color, all you need to do is just say self.image.fill and you need to fill it with a color. Let's say green. We did not define any green color yet and we can do that immediately here. So here is my color. We have a black. Let's add green as well. So I'm going to say green is equal to 0, 255, 0. Because this is RGB, blue will be 0, red will be 0, and all the value will, will go to green. Okay. So we have filled this now with the green. That's good. Next, we need to create the rectangle. We have created it. Now, the position of the rectangle, especially on the Y, needs to be a little bit higher. Because, as you know, the health bar is over the head of the player, right? So to do that, all we need to do is just say self Y minus tile size divided by 2 okay so it's like we are going over the head of the player by around 16 pixels now this health bar is going to be moving actually but how the health bar need to follow the steps of the player all the time right wherever the player go the health bar should go as well if you go back here if you remember at the beginning when we created our map where was our map? Here it is. We said we would like to create a player, actually, a player object, and save it in a variable. And this is why. Because I want to be able to track this player wherever he goes, so I need an object for it to access it. Because I want to access the location of that player all the time. So we need to define a function called move to move this health bar. And as I said, it will follow the player. So I'm going to say here self.track.x. Remember the green bar is nothing but a rectangle as usual, which we need to move its x and y to have it moving. And it will equal to self.game.player 
dot rectangle dot x. So it is the same x as the player x. Wherever the player go, the health bar will go. Same thing for the y. So it's a self dot rect dot y is equal to self dot game dot player dot rect dot y. But since again we need it to be over the head of the player, we need to say tile size minus tile size here over two. Okay, and that's it. Now all we need to say here is define update self and we need to say self dot move okay by that we have created the health bar but who is going to call this health bar well this health bar is going to be called from the player himself okay it's going to be instantiated from there so let's go back to the player simply and instantiate all of that so here is my player let's go over here and say self dot health bar is equal to player underscore health bar and we will pass the same game x and y so what we are doing right now we are instantiating a class inside a class so this health bar now is attached to this player okay now let's try to run this and see what's gonna happen let's fix the issues this should be player. And as you can see now, we have a health bar over the head. Oh, I forgot that we will die if we touch an enemy. Okay, so that's a health bar. That's cool. How about we create a health bar also for the enemy? Do you actually think that we can do the same thing for the enemy? Well, of course we can. Let's add some health bar to the enemy as well. Well, again, a new class for that. I'm going to be saying here instead of player, enemy. And, well, the move is going to change, of course. It's not the player anymore. It's just the self.rectangle right now. Because we want the health bar to follow the enemy, right? So we just need to say here self dot enemy dot rectangle dot x. But you might ask right now, well, how would we know which enemy to follow? Let's say I have instantiated seven enemies. How would we do that? Well, this is very simple. Here in the parameter of the initializer of the enemy, I'm going to add a new parameter. I will call it enemy. Okay. And here I'm going to say self dot enemy is equal to enemy. We created a new variable right now. And here, instead of game player, again, we just need self enemy. And that's it. Now, we are going to instantiate this class, create an object of it, just the same way we did with the player. By going to the enemy class, right here, and just say self.healthbar is equal now to enemy underscore healthbar. And this is all we need. Now, what should we pass instead of enemy? Well, the class itself. We just need to say self here. Why? Let's say that we have created a new enemy, right? Now, this exact enemy that we have created, we are going to pass it to the health bar as a self. You know, if you want to pass the exact class you are working on to another object, you just write self, right? It will pass this whole enemy here. Now, the enemy is passed here and it went to the health bar from here and now we are following that enemy rectangle meaning that we are following if we go back to the enemy we are following right now those rectangles see how the tying up works in object oriented programming you create an enemy you create the health bar you pass this enemy self to the health bar and the health bar will keep track of all of your x's and y's right here and that's really great now now let's jump back. Do we need anything else? I don't think so. Let's test this out. As you can see now, everybody has a health bar. That's really great. The monster has a health bar. You have a health bar. That's good. Now it's time to design the damage to make this health bar decrease until the enemy dies or the player dies. How about we start creating some weapons? 
So far, our player cannot really do anything to attack the enemy. So, how about we create some weapons that we can pick up from the ground and then use them to shoot enemies? Well, first, I'm gonna show you what are the weapons we are going to use. So, we have this cool weapon actually, and it has three frames. And we are going to put it on the floor and it is going to be floating. Now when we shoot with the sword, this sword can shoot actually like some magic power. So this is the shooting that will be coming out of the sword. And we will be creating two classes. One of them is for the weapon and one of them is for the bullet. Because the bullet itself, we need to track it throughout the screen, right? That's very important. So let's do this. I'm going to create a new class. I'm going to call it weapon. And it is going to inherit by game dot sprite dot sprite like this. Then we have diff in it. As usual, we need self game x and y. We need to do some imports because this is a totally new file. We will do that. I'm going to say from sprites import all and from configuration import all and import by game okay now i will go to the block and just copy the template i can copy it from anywhere i want so let's copy all of those and just put them here okay we need to choose which layer the weapon should be on so let's go to configuration and say that Maybe it's below the player. So maybe right here. I'm going to say weapon layer is equal to 4. So not 44, 4. This will be 5 and this will be 6. Now, I'm going to create a new group for all of the weapons. As usual, we need a separate group for every category. So let's do that. Go to the main. Now we are at the main. And here, let's say cell dot weapon is equal to pi game dot sprite dot layered updates okay we are at weapons again and let's say here self dot game dot weapons okay we also need the sprite sheet so let's do it go here self dot weapon underscore sprite sheet is equal to sprite sheet assets images sword the name of the file is sword.png so we will change this from terrain to weapon let's add the y here now we need some animation so we'll say definition animate self let's create a list called animation and let's go and copy that template as it is so we need to go to sprites and let's copy this whole line and paste it here change this to weapon start at zero zero and then if you take a look here we are moving at the x-axis 32 pixels at a time okay so let's copy this paste here and let's say here 32 for the second frame and then we need 64 okay Let's go and copy the rest of the logic so that we don't have to write it down again. Copy all of this from anywhere in the animation. And let's just paste it here. We did a new animation counter, so I'm going to say here self.animation counter is equal to 1. Let's leave this at maybe 0 0.01. I don't want it to change too fast. Then let's add update. So definition, update, self, and we are going to call animate. Self dot animate. And that's it. Now let's go back to our map and choose where should we get the weapon from. We have already placed a letter called W for our weapon. I'm going to change it. Now let's add a weapon somewhere. Now let's say that the weapon is very close to the player just for testing out things. So here is the weapon. Now we will go back to the main and we need to instantiate that weapon. I'm going to say here, if column is equal to W, then weapon, self, J, and I. But we need to also import 
that new weapon file. So here I'm going to say from weapon import all. I really want to organize this. Let's have it that way. That's good. Now let's try to run this game. We have an issue here. We actually forgot one line, which is the image line. So let me add that as well. We need to say here animate or animation. Okay. Now let's try again. Unexpected intent for which line? Okay. Some line was hidden. I just cut this and pasted it again. Okay. Now we're good. Let's try again. Name weapon is not defined. Was it not weapon? Yeah, it's weapons. There's an S. Actually, let's call it weapon. And try again. So let's run this. And here we go. As you can see, this is the sword. But the animation is way too slow. So maybe we need to increase it a little bit. Let's go to weapons and raise this. I don't know, to 0 0.1. Yeah, much better. As you can see, we have a floating sword that we can pick up. Well, we cannot really pick it up yet, so let's see how we can pick it up. To pick up this sword, we just need some simple collision in our weapons and a flag, saying that we have equipped a certain weapon. Okay, so let's do that collision really quick. I'm going to say here diff, collide. Now we will go to the player. And here is my player. We have collide enemy, we have collide block, define collide weapon. We are going to say collide is equal to pi game dot sprite dot sprite collide self self dot game dot weapon. Right? We are now checking if the player is colliding with that weapon. We will have the sword disappear once we collide with it, meaning that we have collected it. And you are going to say here, if collide, we will set a new variable. I'm going to define it in a minute. Self dot sword equip is equal to true. Go back and create that variable. It will be a flag indicating that we have picked up a sword and now we can shoot with it. Self dot sword equipped initially is false until we pick it up okay now go to the update and say self dot collide weapon now let's run this now if we collide with the weapon it will disappear and we have equipped so far so good We've done a good job and we have created our weapon. Now we need the bullets. So whenever we press a key, we would like to shoot something. So first let's create the bullet class. I'm gonna copy all of this and just paste it here, okay? And this one is going to be called bullet. And the bullet is going to be the same as the player layer, okay? We can create a separate layer for that, no problem. And we are going to create a new group for that. So let's go to the main and weapon here. I'm going to self.bullets is equal to updates. Now let's create the sprite sheet. So self.bullet underscore sprite. Sheet is equal to sprite sheet assets images. It's called powerball.png. This is the name of the file. And yeah, now we can go and continue with our class. So let's go to weapons and start implementing. Now, what would we like to implement? I would like to implement some power to that attack. Right now, later we will implement some damage to that attack. Right, we are going to specify how much damage should that weapon or should that bullet uh, inflict on the enemy. 
So the first thing we want to do is to implement the movement of this bullet. Whenever we shoot it, we would like it to go in the right direction. Like if the player is going left, I would like the power ball to go to the left when I shoot it. And it's the same thing for all the other directions. So definition, move, self. Now let us add a direction here. So I'm going to say self dot direction is equal to whatever the player is facing. So self dot game dot player dot direction okay so whenever i shoot a new instance of this bullet is going to be created right and it is going to have the same direction as the player and by the way the object that will be created will be destroyed afterwards so that we don't keep it in the memory so we create a bullet we shoot it once it collides maybe with a block or with an enemy the it will be destroyed but let's not get ahead of ourselves let's program the movement so if self dot direction is equal to right so if we are going to the right well we would like to shoot to the right how would do we shoot to the right we change the x coordinate of that bullet by incrementing it so self dot rec dot x plus equal bullet steps we are going to define the speed of that bullet of that bullet so we'll go to configuration and here we are going to say bullet steps let's say that the bullet is faster than the player and that makes sense maybe six okay uh here it should be if all right now we will do the same thing for every other direction we have left minus we have up again minus and this should be y and then we have y here with a plus and it should be down right we increment when we go down increment the y coordinate let's create an update method so diff update and then self and let's call the move self dot move all right now we have created the bullet class let's see how we can shoot it All right, so right now we will be integrating all of this into our player. So we need to add a bullet object every time we press a certain key so that we can see the bullet being shot. But we have some few issues here. <laughs> here it should be steps instead of a step. We have a variable mismatch naming. And also here it's not weapons. This one should be bullets, right? And here... We need to go to the bullet spreadsheet. Was it bullets or bullet? Let's take a look. It's a bullet spreadsheet, okay. And here it should be zero, zero. All right, this should be it for now. Let's go to the player class and, and let's create a new method. We are going to call it a shooting sword. So definition shoot sword self. And let's say if we press the Z key, we are going to shoot. So we are going to copy this logic here. So we are going to say here pressed is equal to pi game dot key dot get underscore pressed. Okay, that's the first thing. Next, we need to check if we are pressing anything, if we are pressing the Z key, and if we are equipped with a sword. Now we need to check if we are equipped with the sword. So I'm going to say if self dot sword equipped, if we equipped the sword, meaning that we picked up the sword, then we need to check if the key is pressed. If pressed and particularly by game dot K underscore Z, if we press the Z key, then we would like to create a new bullet. I'm going to say here bullet and we need to pass game as usual and the x and the y of my player so we need just to say self dot rect dot x and self dot rect dot y because the bullet need to start at the position of my player right in this way we will see the bullet coming out of the player all right so far so good i think we have some typos somewhere yes right here if we take a look this should be sprite and this should be layered now let's try to run this and see if we have any more issues. We picked up the sword. 
we are trying to shoot but nothing is happening because we did not include it in the update as well so again shoot sort need to be added to the update here we go self dot shoot sort okay now let me try again let's pick up the sort and we have another issue bullet is not defined this time so let's import the weapons from weapons import all so let us test things out if i run this let's pick up the sword and try to shoot and here we go we can shoot in all the directions correctly now there is a problem as you can see when we shoot first we are shooting multiple balls at the same time because there is not the bouncing on what we are shooting right now and also the bullets are just going to infinity without hitting any enemy or hitting any obstacles all right so let us work on solving our first issue so here's our game and we collected the sword as you can see the shooting is ridiculous because as long as i am pressing on the z key i am shooting continuously and this is really not nice let us incorporate one more simple state machine in our player and this state machine is going to wait a little bit after we start shooting okay so here's our player and here i'm going to define a variable i'm gonna call it counter it will start at zero and then i will say self dot wait time it's like waiting for multiple loops before we can shoot again let's say 20 initially okay next we need to define a state self dot uh, shooting state or shoot state is equal initially to shoot we will have two states one of them is shoot and the other one is wait okay let's define this new method now i'm gonna say define wait after shoot so after we press the z key we cannot press it again until we wait a little bit so first we're going to say if self.state is equal to wait meaning that we have set this to wait then we will start incrementing the counter self.counter plus equal one we are incrementing it by one now we will check the counter if self.counter is larger or equal to self.wait time then we would be doing the following we will set the counter to zero and then we are going to set the state to shoot again it's called the shoot state let's set it to shoot again now who is going to set the state to wait of course it's going to be right here after we create a new bullet meaning that we press the button we check if the sword is equipped meaning that we picked up the sword from the ground then we check if we press z a bullet will be created and now we cannot create a new bullet until we wait for a certain amount of time so this will be self dot state is going to equal to wait okay now let's put this method in the update here is our update we're going to say self dot wait after shoot and well that's it let me fix this really quick okay now let's test this out i'm gonna run uh, we have a problem here it's called yeah shoot state not only state should state here and should state here okay let's try it again and we picked up the sword something is still off let's see why it's not working yes because right here we need to only access this section if the state is equal to shoot so here's if self dot state is equal to shoot then we can do all of that right because if we are in the wait state, I don't want to be able to shoot again, right? Otherwise, what's the point of all of this wait after shoot function? So, let's try again. Again, did we just call it state again? I think so. So, this is a shoot state. Pick up the sword and let's try to shoot. Again, it's still not working. Let's try to fix it further okay and the issue is again this is state i'm not really sure why i am stuck with the state keyword it should be shoot state okay so let's try again 
hopefully this time it will work pick up the sword and here we go this is much much better now we don't have this continuous shooting but still i don't feel that it is very responsive maybe we can make it a little bit faster so to make it faster all we need to do is just change that waiting time so let's go back to the player and maybe change this to 10 instead of 20. try again pick up the sword yeah this is more responsive right now okay so that is one of the issues now we have one more issue which is the bullets are going to infinity so we need them to collide at the enemy or at a block and then disappear and this takes a lot of memory as well because we are creating objects for all of these bullets like in here if we take a look if we go down you'll see that we are creating tons of those objects and that's not really good we want the bullet to hit a block and then disappear and by disappearing we are going to delete this object so we can do this very simply if we go to bullet here and then we would create a method let's say it's called collide underscore block self and we will use the same collision we were using before so let's copy this and just add it here we will check if there is a collision between the bullet and the blocks so self.game.blocks if there is a collision i would like the bullet to disappear and also i want to delete it so i'm going to say here if collide then we are going to call a method which is called kill now kill is a method that comes with this sprite sprite that we are inheriting once you do that it will kill the object and delete it from the memory so we will make it disappear and then we are going to remove it from the memory to enhance the performance so this is for block collision we also need enemy collision right now we won't inflict any damage so here we are going to say collide and instead of a block we will say enemy and then if we collide with any enemy like that we are going to do the same thing now we are going to copy those two functions or methods like that and we have the collide the block as well now let's test if this will work now let me run it let's pick up the sword and let's try to shoot okay we have an issue here we are actually making the rock disappear so yeah and the enemy is disappearing as well and the health bars are just floating over there we need to fix this uh, let's jump back to weapons so this one is going to actually delete the object that we are touching so it's doing the opposite of what we want to do so instead we are going to keep this at false okay we don't want to delete the object that it is touching but we only want to kill the bullet itself let's try it again pick up the sword let's try and as you can see the bullets are disappearing let's try to hit an enemy we have a problem with shooting upwards we will fix it yeah but it is disappearing when hitting the enemy let's try the water uh okay it's not disappearing on the water that's totally okay it makes sense that the bullet goes over the water but again shooting upwards is problematic let's try to fix it let's go to weapons all right i think i know what's happening let me rear on this and just show you really quick when we take the sword and we try to shoot upwards we are hitting the health bar so somehow it's considering the health bar as an enemy let's go and check our health bar in sprite health bar yes it's called enemies instead of health bar that's not really good let's see if we have created a group for the health bar we did not so let's add here a group for the health bar so i'm going to say self dot health bar is equal to pi game dot sprite dot layered updates okay now we can go back to sprites and change this enemies to health bar okay 
so this is our health bar right now we will do the same thing for the player okay now let me read this this uh, I think we have another issue by game dot sprite dot layered updates we forgot the D and here again this is a health bar let's retry this let's pick up the sword and try to shoot upwards and here we go so right now the shooting is perfectly okay and we only need now to start designing the damaging system let's start working on a really fun part which is the damage system so far when we play this game we can go collect weapons we can shoot but the enemy just does not die so what we want to do exactly here is whenever we hit the enemy the health is going to decrease so that the enemy will not die maybe from only one shot so let's start implementing this now to do that we would like to specify the enemy health right so the enemy should have certain health point and whenever we shoot at it it's going to decrease depending on how powerful the weapon that is shooting is so there is multiple moving pieces here let us jump and go to the enemy sprite here is our enemy sprite enemy class now let me specify two parameters one of them is the current health and the other one is the total health we want the total health because it's going to help us in displaying how much we have taken due to damage from that health you'll see what i mean in a minute I'm going to say here self.health is equal, let's say, to 6. Let's say that this enemy has a health of 6. Now, I want to go to configuration, and I'm going to define here enemy underscore health, which is the total health, and it equals to 6. Okay? We can do this even better by just going to sprites over there, and here say enemy health. So that if we change the enemy health in the configuration, it will change here. So let's jump back to the enemy health bar this one and we need to add a few more methods the first one is called kill bar so define kill bar why do we need a kill bar well when the enemy dies i would like the health bar to disappear as well because right now we have a mechanism that will have the enemy disappear but we don't have a mechanism for the health bar as well to disappear otherwise the health bar will be just floating around after the enemy dies So here we are going to say kill bar and this is very simple it will only kill the object of the enemy health bar so we would say here self dot kill and as we said before kill is nothing but a method that is inherited from the spy game sprite sprite which will delete the whole object and remove it from memory okay so this is for kill bar we also need damage now this kill bar will be called whenever the health of the enemy is zero then we will call this method next damage so we need a method for the damage right in order to display damage what i would like to do here is to have a red rectangle drawn over the green rectangle and this red rectangle is going to decrease in width with respect to what is the current health of the enemy how can we implement that well it's very simple we'll just say here self dot image dot fill and we will fill it with red so far we don't have red so let's go and define it red is actually 255 zero zero so red is equal to red is 255 green is zero and blue is zero okay now let's jump back here let us define what is the width of that rectangle this width is going to change right it makes sense because every time the enemy takes damage the width will decrease so here i'm going to say width is equal to self dot rect dot width we would like to change the width of this rectangle that we are creating here and this one will be multiplied by the following we need health and we need total health 
Where will those come from? Well, we will pass them to the damage. I'm going to pass here total health, which is the total health of the enemy, and the health. Okay, and this total health is actually this parameter most of the time. But we are having the flexibility to change it later. So this is why we are passing it to damage. Next, after we define the width, we are going to draw that rectangle. So how do we draw a rectangle? We can say pygame.draw.rect, and then we will pass the image, self.image. Image is actually the surface right now. If you take a look here, it's a surface. So when you want to draw a rectangle, you need a surface to draw it on, and it is that image. Then we need the color green, and then we will be passing the following parameters. We have zero, zero, then we have width, the new width that we have just calculated, small letter, then we need self.height. And we will pass zero here for the border. Okay, so what did we do here? The enemy takes damage. We pass the current health after taking the damage, and we divide it by the total health, okay, multiplied by what is the rectangle original width. This will give us a shrinking width of the rectangle, indicating that the health of the enemy is decreasing. And we are drawing this red rectangle every single time after every damage. Now, this is for the health bar, but where is the damage being taken anyway? Well, let's make the enemy take the damage right now. Let's go to the enemy. And we are going to define a new method, and it's going to be called damage. So I'm going to say here, definition, damage, and self. Now, what are we going to do with this? Well, damage is going to be passed another parameter, which is called amount. And this will tell us how much damage we are taking. What's next? Let's say that you shot using that fireball that we used before. The enemy got shot, and the fireball has a power of 3. So what's going to happen is we are going to subtract the power of that fireball attack from the current enemy health. So it says self.health is equal to self.health, let's say minus amount. Okay, this amount will be how powerful that attack was. Now we can call the health bar damage function. So I'm going to say here self.healthbar.damage, the function that we have just created, and then we will be passing enemy health and we will pass the current health of the enemy okay so what happened now what is going on this is the enemy health bar we have just created something called damage and we can call it in order to change how the rectangle of that health looks like so whenever we take damage we will find a way to call this damage function don't worry about that when we take damage we subtract the health of the enemy we have a health variable here which we have defined, we will subtract it depending on what is the power of the attack, and then we are going to update the current health bar. Now, if the health of that enemy is equal or less to zero, I'm gonna make the enemy disappear because it dies. So I'm gonna say if self.health is less or equal to zero, then self.kill, meaning the enemy will die, and then we are going to say self health bar dot kill meaning that let the enemy disappear and let the health bar above it also disappear all right so how will all of this play out let's try to compile to fix any issues then we are going to see how we can decrement the health so far as i said there is multiple moving pieces and we cannot see the whole picture until we are done so let us just compile to see if we have any syntax issues we are picking up we are shooting we have no issues so far. Okay, now, in order to start decrementing and doing some damage, we need to go to weapon. In weapons, we are going to modify this collide enemy, actually. So I'm going to just delete all of this collide enemy right now, and we are going to rewrite. So right now, this is correct for the collide portion, but if there is a collision, I would like to call the damage function on the enemy that was touched by that bullet. Okay? So, we have a bullet, we shot the enemy, and we would like to decrease the health only of that enemy. But how can we see which enemy was shot? Because right now, this is a bullet class, and we are checking if it is colliding with any enemy. Now, to get the enemy that is actually colliding, we need to do the following. 
I'm going to say here, if collide, then collide zero. And this zero is actually the first object that was collided with. What is the first object that the bullet collided? It's that particular enemy because we have multiple enemies. And this one will tell you that I have collided with this certain enemy on the map. Now you can call the damage method that we have created there on that enemy. And you can pass one, meaning that the damage done is one. If you don't want to do that directly, we can do it better. We can say self dot damage is equal, let's say, to one. And here we can just pass self dot damage, meaning that we can change the damage just from the initialization. Now let's try to test this out to see if it will work or we will have some issues. Let's pick up the weapon like that and let's start shooting. Uh, we got an issue, let's start fixing that. It says here total health is not defined. We have misspelled it. Let me try again. Let's pick up the... And here we go. As you can see right now, the bullet is walking over the enemy and just erasing him. That's good and bad at the same time. What I want to happen is, is that whenever the bullet touches the enemy, I want the bullet to disappear. So far, we did not manage to do that. This is why the bullet keep colliding with the enemy until it decreases the health to zero. That could be like a super powerful uh, bullet, actually. We can use it. We can utilize that. But for now, this is not our goal. I just want the bullet to touch the enemy once and disappear. Okay, so to do that, let's go back to weapons. And let's add one more thing here. I'm going to say self.kill. Meaning that after there is a collision with the enemy, I would like this bullet to disappear. Let's try again and see if this will have any effect. Pick up the weapon, let's shoot that enemy, and as you can see, the health is decreasing by the amount of the shot. Let's try to kill him. So here we go, and the enemy dies. Enemy here died as well, here as well. And as you can see, the rectangle is working perfectly well. This is really boring because the enemies right now uh, are not doing anything, but that's totally okay. All right, so right now let's work on the damage system for the player. So far we were able to shoot the enemies and decrease their health. How about we have the enemy now shoot some bullets and inflict damage on the player? That will be our next task. Well, let's go to the player class first. And do the same thing regarding health. So right now I'm going to say here self.health. Let's say is equal to 10. And let's go to configuration. And say here player health is equal to 10. Actually, again, I think I should have done this in the beginning. So let this be uh, player health. Now, we need to work on the damage system. First, let's jump to the health bar of the player and implement the same thing. So this is the health bar of the player. Let's add the damage method. So this is define damage and here we need self. We will do the same thing. We'll say self.image.fill red. This is for the health rectangle. We have talked about that previously. Next we need the width again. So this will be self.rect.width. This would be the width of the rectangle multiplied by a percentage of self.game.player dot health divided by player underscore health next we just need to draw the rectangle i'm going to say here by game dot draw dot rect then self dot image then we will need to draw green and then here zero zero the new width self dot height and we need to pass the border of that rectangle to be zero I think we did everything capital letters, so let me fix it really quick. Alright, so this should be it for the damage. Now let's go to the weapons and let's create a new bullet. This one will be the enemy bullet. Because the enemy bullet is going to behave a little bit different than the regular bullet. 
So here we are going to say enemy bullet. Okay. Now in terms of collision, we need to fix this. Instead of collide enemy, we need to say collide the player. And we need to see if there is a collision with the player. What was the name of the uh, player group over there? Let's take a look in the main. And yeah, it's called main player. So let's go here and just check if there is a collision with the main player. Let's go to the... Let's go here and just change this to main player. Okay, we will check if there is a collision there. And here, the damage, it's going to be not this one, but because since we only have one player, we can just simply say self.game.player.damage. And then here, we will say self.damage. Okay. All right. Now, the only thing missing is that the enemies is not yet shooting. Well, we'll see how we can organize that. But first, let us test if everything is still working or did we break anything. So, yeah, things are still working. Now, what's left, as I said, is to actually have the enemies shoot. And when should the enemies shoot? Now, let's try to have the enemy shoot any bullet at all. So, at the moment, the enemy is not shooting anything. Let's forget about when should the enemy shoot. Forget about all the strategy. And let's have it shoot anything at all. Okay, to see if we have any issues with the damaging system. So let's go back to Sprite and let's go to the enemy class and let's say that the enemies will be shooting all the time. Okay, just to check things out. So let's say we are moving to the left. I'm gonna be creating a new bullet object. So enemy bullet and let's pass it the right parameters. We have self.game. We need self.rect.x. We need to have the x component of the player, right? Because the bullet needs to start from the player position. And we have self.rect.y. Okay? I'm going to be copying and pasting this for all the directions. I know this is really crazy right now to have the enemy just shooting all the time. But as I said, we want to debug things first. See if the player will die maybe if we hit that or not. Okay, so now we have it in all direction except when we are stalling. So let's try to run this and see what issues we will have. As you can see, we have an issue, but all the enemies are starting to shoot. Good. What is the issue? Collide enemy is not defined. Yes, because we have changed the method name to collide the player instead. So it's collide the player now. Let's go back to the main and let's try again. As you can see right now, the enemies are shooting all over the place. Let's say if we get hit, okay, player does not have an attribute called damage. All right, so here we are having an issue. Let's go back to the main. We are definitely creating a player here. And let's see if the player has damage. I'm sure that we have done something like that. So this is a player, move, update, animation, collide, collide. Oh, we did not create a damage for the player? Yeah, I guess we forgot to create that. We created damage for the health bar, but not for the player. Okay, so the player damage system is going to be the same as the enemy. So let's jump back here. We'll say define damage, then self and amount. That's correct. We forgot to totally to do that. Okay, now... I'm going to say here self.health is equal to self.health minus amount, just like the enemy. Nothing new here. Then self.health bar, we are going to call the method called damage from the health bar. We have also seen this. Nothing new. Then if self.health is less or equal to zero, then I would like to kill the player meaning delete its object and make it disappear from the screen. And I think we need to say self.running is equal to zero, meaning we need to stop the game. This one needs to be self. Okay, now let's try again. Let's try to get into the range of the shooting and we have another issue. There is no attribute draw. I think we have reversed those 
because we need to say draw rectangle and not rectangle draw, right? So we need to say draw a rectangle with those parameters. Okay, now let me try again. Let's get into the range of the shooting and here we go. The player is a disappearing, but the health bar is not disappearing. So let's fix this as well. Uh, there is the player damage. We need to kill the health bar. We are already saying kill health bar, but somehow this is not happening. Okay, so it seems that here we did not say kill health bar. So I'm going to say here define kill underscore health bar self and we need to say self dot kill. Okay, and the game is not stopping for some reason. Let's say here self dot health bar dot kill health bar. This should make it disappear but wasn't the variable called running yes it's game dot running actually okay because the running variable is in the game actually in the main and not in this class directly okay so let us try again and we died that's good we died and the and the game stopped but as you can see right now the bullets are not disappearing when hitting the player, so we need to solve that as well. The same way we solved it for the player bullet, we can solve it for the enemy bullet. Let's jump back to the enemy bullet. It's in weapons. Oh, it looks like that we are already killing it. That's good. But I think the many shooting that we are shooting already are the reason. Okay, so... So far, this is working as expected, I guess. Let's go back to sprites and maybe not stop the game, just to see if everything is working as expected, if the health bar is disappearing, and if the player is disappearing. So to do that, we just need to go back to player, health bar. So this is the player. Let's not stop the game, and let's try to die. And here we go. Let's try it out and we died that's good everything is working as expected next let's make the enemy shoot one ball at a time all right so let us create some dumb way to just shoot one bullet at a time from the enemy perspective let's go back to the sprites and go to the enemy and specifically to where we are shooting well I would like to have a very simple shooting function that is going to wait a random amount of time before shooting to the direction of where the enemy is at the moment. Okay, so how can we implement something like this? I'm gonna create here a function that is called shoot and we need some counters here. I'm gonna hit say self dot shoot counter equal to zero and self dot wait shoot. And let's let this be random dot choice between multiple options. Uh, let's say maybe sometimes 10, sometimes 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Sometimes it will wait too long. Sometimes it will wait a little bit. So let that be unpredictable. All right. And I'm going to have here self dot shooting state. I'm going to call it shoot state is equal to initially. Let's call it halt so we have shoot or halt initially we are not shooting now we will be counting we are going to say here self dot uh, shoot counter plus equals one we are incrementing the shoot counter then here we will say if self dot shoot counter is equal equal to wait shoot meaning that let's say that we have waited enough now we are going to increment this counter i'm going to say self dot shoot counter plus equals one now we will only shoot when that counter reached wait shoot. So I'm going to say here if self dot shoot counter is equal equal to wait shoot self dot wait shoot, meaning that we have waited enough. I'm going to set the state. I'm going to say self dot shoot state is equal to shoot, and I'm going to reset the counter. I'm going to say self counter is equal to zero. Okay. So it's a very simple logic. We will keep counting. Only when that counter reaches any of the value that are predetermined, we will set the state to shoot 
so that we can shoot in any direction okay so maybe let's have this if it is larger or equal okay now let's jump back here and just add a very simple condition we will just say here if self.state is equal equal to shoot then we are going to be shooting okay so let me add this condition to all the state or we can just actually cut it out of here okay now we can just paste it here as well here and finally here after we shoot we would like to move the state back to hold so i'm going to say here self dot state it's not called the state actually it's called shoot state self dot shoot state is equal to halt again this is shoot state for all of those okay now we need the halt for everything again after we shoot we don't want to be in the shooting state anymore all right so let's test this logic out i'm gonna run it we have an issue yeah we need to put this to parentheses because this is a function that we are calling let me try again here we go let's take a look if any shooting is going to happen actually i'm not seeing any shooting anymore okay let's debug and see why because we are not actually calling the shoot function in the update so let's go to the update self dot shoot remember any function that need to be called there should be a place where we are calling it and the update is being triggered in every cycle so it makes sense let's try again here we go it is shooting but the shooting is actually it's true that it is waiting, but we are still spraying, actually. Hmm. I don't think it's even waiting, actually, because, well, we are only not shooting in halt. So let's take a look again. Let's debug this by printing the state we are in. So self.shoot state. This is a good way to debug what's going on. Okay. So right now, we will debug what is going on exactly and we will see the output here so right now we are in halt shoot shoot we are still in shoot interestingly we are not moving to halt anymore okay let's see why oh okay i think i found it this one is called shoot counter and it's not resetting not counter so this is shoot counter okay let's try again and maybe let's remove this right now let's take a look and things are a little bit better now they are just shooting yeah that's really really good and the game is much harder to play right now okay that's really fun <laughs> we can run away we can actually make these bullets even faster all right so so far so good so right now i have noticed a bug in our game so if we start the game and just you'll see that the camera is not working again and that's an issue and the reason of that because if we jump back to the sprites file we will see in the player we have two collision we have collide block and collide enemy and as you can see now here we are setting the self game collided to true otherwise we are setting it to false and we're doing the same thing here on the same flag see here collided is being set to true on false the same way it is being set here and both of those methods are being called in the update. So whenever we are colliding with a block, the enemy is going to say, hey, I don't have any collision, and it's going to override the collision flag. Why is the collision flag important? 
because we have designed our camera to depend on that flag. It needs to be false in order for the camera to stop moving on collision. To solve this, we have multiple ways. The easiest way would be to create two flags, one of them for the enemy collision and the other one is for the uh, block collision. So we can go back to the main right here and we can say here uh, enemy collided and we can say self dot block collided now when we go to the camera we need either of those flags to be false so if self uh, enemy underscore collided equals false or self dot block collided is going to equal false either of them now we go back to sprites and we change this to block and we are going to change this one as well to block we will also go to the enemy here and say here enemy and here as well we will say enemy collided let's see if this solution will work let's try and the camera is still not working uh, let's go back Oh, oh, wait, wait, sorry about that. This needs to be AND, actually, not OR, because this is not to stop the camera, this is to move the camera. So if any of those is actually in collision, it means that I want to stop moving the camera. Okay, this makes more sense. Okay, now we are working. No problem, and we die because we have touched the enemy. I would like to add some kind of decoration to the player. Now, what do I mean by that? We are going to talk right now about particles. Now, particles are, just as the name indicates, they are just small dots like that or small squares like that. You can see them in a lot of RPG games or even platform games where you'll see like snow is scattered all around the screen and it is moving in a random way or in a mathematical way. Or you might see the player, let's say, standing still like that, and there is some particles that are floating like that around him. So it's a really nice system, and it can add some decoration to your game, and you can use it in multiple places. So let's learn how we can create particles. I will go to sprites, and I'm going to create a new class. Actually, the sprites file is getting way too large, and... I think it got way bigger than I anticipated it to be. So you can feel free to divide it into multiple files. Maybe put the health bars in a different file, put the particles also in a different file. Especially for particles, you might add multiple types of particles, but it's really up to you. For now, I'm going to just add it here. I'm going to say class particles, capital letter. And then, as usual, we have by game dot sprite dot sprite okay now i'm gonna copy all the other stuff just as usual like that okay i want this to be the same as the health layer that is totally fine and actually here i don't have enemy so we can remove it and we also need the initializer so let me just add the initializer as well and here we go now we have the X, the Y, we also need the rectangles. I think we did not copy them yet. So here is our rectangles and we're good. Now, let us modify this to our needs. Okay, so let's add the initializer. So we have diff in it and then we have self, game, X and Y. Okay, now let's do the template. We have self dot underscore layer is equal to Let's leave it at the health layer. You can create a separate layer for that. But for me, the health layer would do fine here. And then we have groups as usual. So self.groups is equal to self.game.all underscore sprites. We can add a separate group for the particles, but there is no need at least for the moment. So let's leave it at just the general group. Now, you need to create a surface. So to create a surface, we just need to say self.image is equal to pygame.surface like that. And then we need to specify what is the size of every particle. Now, I told you that we will be creating multiple particles, but they will all start from one class and then we will instantiate multiple objects from that class for every single particle. 
So let's say that this size is 4 by 4 pixels. This should be enough. Now I want to fill it with a color. So I'm going to say self.image.color fill and then double parentheses. And let's say that the particles are white. Okay, so this is white 255, 255, and 255. Now we need to create a rectangle. This is also very simple self.rect is equal to self.image.getRect. So again, we created a surface which will look like a square and we have colored it. So it's like we created a square here. And now we would like to change its x and y position. We get the rectangle and then we start getting the x coordinate of that rectangle we have extracted. So it's going to be x and self.rect.y is going to equal to y. Now I would like to play around with where the x and the y should be. But let us test this step by step first. Now let's have those squares that we have created. Let, let's have them move. So I'm going to say define move self. We're going to say self.rect.y plus equals one. I want those particles to be floating up from the player position all the way up, like an aura or like some really kind of lighting that is uh, coming from the ground up to the player. So this is why we are incrementing the Y. Now here is the catch. I want this particle to go up a certain distance and then it will disappear because I don't want to keep generating particles forever without killing them. Otherwise, we will run out of memory, we will cause a lot of memory issues, because the particles will never be destroyed, especially that we might be having hundreds of particles all the time. So, to do that, I'm going to be creating a very simple counter. Let's say self.lifetime. This is the lifetime of my particle. Let it equal to 6. And then we have self.counter is equal to 0. Now we will start counting self counter plus one plus equal one then if we reach that lifetime so if self dot counter is equal equal to self dot lifetime i'm going to reset this counter self dot counter is equal to zero and i want to kill that particle so self dot kill okay so it's like we have a square it's a floating up for a certain amount of time and then disappearing Finally, we need the update method, so define update, and then we have self, and here we will say self.move. Okay, this is very nice. Now it's time to instantiate this. Let's go back to our player, and here is my player. What do I want to do here exactly? Well, all we need to do is to come here to the player initializer and just say particle, and then pass self.game self.rect.x and self.rect.y okay in the initializer we will be creating this particle so let me test this out we have an issue let's see particle is not defined let's jump down yeah let it be particle not particles we run this again let's rerun health layer is not defined Let's fix this. Let's try again. Particle has no game. Oh, yeah, we need to instantiate game. So self dot game is equal to game. Try again. This should be get underscore rectangle. And as you can see, we can see nothing at the moment. Okay, now, so we don't have any issues right now. Let's go to the player and the start. Uh, modifying things up. Here is my player. Now I'm gonna take this and just put it in the movement. So whenever I am moving, I am creating a new particle. We can actually even remove this from the initializer. That's totally okay. That was just for testing. Now every time we move, we would get a particle. So let's see how would this turn out. Okay, so right here we have forgot to actually initialize the sprite. So I'm gonna say by game dot sprite dot sprite dot initialize we have self and self dot groups okay now let's try again and as you can see we have this weird looking line that is following the player the white line well this is not a real particle this is 
some really weird particles and the reason is that all the particles are stacked above each other and they are not really looking natural so let us fix this I'm gonna go to sprites here for the X we are going to change where the X is going to be spawned so the X position of that particle is going to change so I'm gonna say here plus random choice we're gonna put values like minus 4 minus 3 minus 1 0 1 5 10 20 something like that now the values of the x are going to change and the y i want the y to be fixed so it will be y plus tile size y plus tile size because i want all the particles to start from the feet or below the feet of the player not above the player just on the feet of the player so right now if I try this and here we go can you see that we have random particles that are just following the player and they really look cool you can change the color of these particles so maybe we can make them red or green depending on what we have defined so far so here fill could be I don't know green maybe I think we have defined the green in the configuration and as you can see right now they are green green is really the same color as the grass so maybe let's have them red and we have red as well actually let's return them to white it's the best one and here we go now this particle system can be generalized to be floating all around the map you can make those sprites around the enemy whenever you shoot at him I mean there is infinite possibilities for those decorations so i really hope that you have enjoyed what we have learned so far